Hey everyone, I'm Evan and welcome to another episode of the Prof Noctis Show. This week we have the amazing Jesse Cox. And I'm Wade, aka Professor Noctis, and you're going to love this interview. For the first hour, we are talking about Jesse's origin story. So if you're a content creator, you're really going to love that. Um, and even if you're not, you're going to hear a lot of stories about his past and things that you can do in your own life uh, just to incorporate some of that stuff. Hour two is where we get into theories, understanding rebirth. So you're definitely going to want to get into some of that stuff. Uh, so excited that you're here. We're going to have a great episode. And with that, let's, let's mosey. mosey. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Prof Noctis Weekly Show. We are so excited uh, because Evan and I are joined today by Jesse Cox. Let's Say go. hey, Jesse. Oh, hello. <laughs> We are so excited to have you, uh, Jesse, because not only are you um, one of the most prolific Final Fantasy creators, Final Fantasy XIV especially, but you are just a prolific creator, period. Like, I, we were looking over your kind of rap sheet, I guess, and like all of the things that you've been a part of. Like, we have no idea how we're going to fit it all into one interview, but we're going to do our very best today. So <laughs> yes. I cannot imagine the the worlds and planets that had to shift for you to make time for this. But thank you so, so thank much you, you. for your time today. Pleasure is entirely mine. I'm a little worried we might be conflating prolific with just like been around way too long, <laughs> but I'll take it and I'm not going to tell you otherwise. <laughs> Fair enough, you know, potato, potato. But uh, yeah, I, I'll tell you, like, um, I um, I started watching some of your content during the Final Fantasy XIV lore stuff. Because sure. like most of us um, who want to do research and understand lore, we have no idea whatsoever when it comes to the vocabulary and all that stuff. The, my favorite video that you posted before we get into anything else was your beautiful description between astral and umbral. Like it absolutely was like, oh, that's how we think of this. It, it shifted my worldview entirely of that game. And uh, I'm always like, any, anytime I stream it or anything, I'm like, you've got to go check out Jesse's video uh, because it explains this perfectly, better than I could. So thank you for that. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, no, my pleasure. Thank you for watching it. Uh, it's one of those things where I am just a big old lore nerd when it comes to everything I do. So any game I'm playing, I'm like, what's that mean? How's that work? What's Story is the most important thing. And uh, it's weird to say that because sometimes I'll play a game that is truly terrible, but I'm like engaged in what's happening. Even if mechanically it's bad, I'm like, yo, this is so cool. So uh, yeah, I'm just obsessed with that kind of stuff. And that comes just from being a big history nerd background. So uh, like knowing why things are happening is very important to me. And if there's no connection between them, if I'm doing a thing, and you've given me no reason why I should be doing it. I am not invested. I will just won't do it. I'll be like, nah, I'm all right. That is fair. That is fair. I think that's a great segue uh, to getting to know you a little bit before we get into the deep Final Fantasy lore later, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, it'll be fun. Uh, you studied history and drama in college, I understand, uh, somewhere in New Ooh. York, but you didn't grow up in New York. Tell me how you ended up at a school in New York based on where you grew up and why you studied drama and history. Sure. Well, uh, so I grew up in Ohio, but I before that was traveling all over the place, my Dad was a football coach, and my mom was getting her doctorate at the time. So we were kind of like all over the place. We finally settled down when she was getting her PhD, and we settled in Ohio. And my dad went from becoming a coach to working at a law school. Don't ask me how any of that happens. I was a child. No. I don't know how any of that works. But uh, I just sort of like realized at some point that I enjoyed the – storytelling of history mm -hmm. like I, english and history did very well science and math unless it was like earth science and maybe money-based math like economics mm -hmm. yeah it was not happening the minute you throw letters into math i'm like i don't what what do you mean so that was not but 
English and history I was very into, and uh, I also loved drama and acting and doing that kind of stuff. Um, and so, uh, and that literally is just ego boosting. I the first play I ever did was um, in seventh grade, Mister mm -hmm. Night's Dream. I played Bottom, a guy who does a play in a play, and during the end of it, where he dies on stage, like dies in the play in the play. I just kept hamming it up and like dying repeatedly on stage. And like, while other people are talking, I get up and die again. And I got a standing ovation at the end. And I was like, this is the thing. I'm doing this forever. This is what I love. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's kind of the vibe of why, even though I was into history, I also liked acting stuff. Yeah. And so when I went off to college and New York was kind of like, that's where that's, that's where the Broadway is. You gotta go. <laughs> I'm going into show business, mother. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and so I started working uh, on a, at a radio station. Oh, cool! And I was doing all sorts of different stuff, um, but I realized at a certain point that while I was pursuing theater, I'm just taking all these other classes. I'm getting the credits for a history degree as well, so like, why not? Okay. And so I just started doing both, and then at a certain point, I was just uh, mostly I'm going to blame my parents for this. They were like, "You're not going to make any money being in theater. What are you doing? You're going <laughs> to." And so I was like, well, I guess I could become a teacher. That's fine. Okay. And it sort of just got crazy in there. And then I ended up becoming a teacher. And um, uh, I wanted to do different voice acting things. I definitely got like a lot of great auditions for some crazy stuff. Really? But no matter what, uh, I'm going to be real, real here. Um, I'm not the best actor. <laughs> Turns out I'm mediocre at best. And so uh, I d focused more on teaching. And it during that time period... Uh, while I was teaching, uh, during the summers, I would, you know, do voiceover work for various people who are doing wow machinimas. And I would um, create oh. different videos and throw them on the internet. And so uh, around 2010, just after everything went to hell financially in the country, mm -hmm. they just canned us. Uh, all of us, uh, if you were not tenured, it, mm -hmm. you were, you, it was, it was, it was oh, a rough man. time. So... I lost my job and it was during that time period where my options were either become a sub and as a former nuisance child will say, I was like, no way I'm going to be a sub. That's pure karma. They would destroy, they'd eat me alive. Yeah. So I was like, no. And so I uh, just created videos on the internet. And then one day, uh, my dear friend, John Bain was like, yo, do you want to make money doing this? I was like, what do you mean by that? And that was winter 2010. And, uh, by 20 March 2012, I had moved out to LA and have been living here ever since, doing this as a real thing. It's crazy that that happened. But uh, I'm convinced, had it not been for the financial crisis that we had as a country, I would probably still be a teacher. Because well, I'm go. one of those people There's that a... like overcommits, you know? I will always be like, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay to this. So, yeah. yeah. Give me two seconds. Yeah, here. There's a I'm silver gonna, lining. Hey, wait, I'm going to bump, the... I'm gonna bump down his audio just a sec. Okay. Sorry. No, it's great. No, it's great. Okay, great. We're good now. I'll make a note. Thanks. Fair enough. So uh, there's the silver lining to the financial crisis. In, uh, <laughs> for in me that, personally, that, yes. For, for you, you know, was it worth it for the world? Who knows? But for you, it's real. Bad. Right, right. I mean, it's one of those um, things where, uh, you know, sometimes yeah. when you something bad happens, there is some sort of good that can come of it. And in this case, being completely broke and jobless and having to move home the flip side was it gave me so much free time that I could sit down and learn to edit and create content and oh, yeah. do stuff in a way that I could pump things out and get in on what was really the second wave of YouTube. Yeah. And because of that, I got to have a career and this is what I do. So amazing. I'm pretty thankful for it. Yeah. yeah no, I, listen, I, I say that a little tongue in cheek because, you know, Evan knows that this is kind of my story too. You know, I was teaching these classes at the mm -hmm. University of Alabama on video games and religion and literature and all this stuff. And then COVID happens and I, Zoom couldn't handle live streaming Final Fantasy 15. So I had to go to Twitch and then like it just kind of happened because we're all sure. at home and stuff. So like the very fact that you're on this show right now is because of one of those kind of like world changing events that's like, oh man. So um, I, I appreciate you saying that. You, you mentioned that you were a, a teacher. I got, I want to clarify, were you high school, middle school? What a uh, history teacher? Talk to us about high it. High school. Yeah, I was a high school teacher and okay. our school, because they were doing a lot of cost cutting stuff, 
I taught history, but it became humanities because mm -hmm. they were doing English and history in one classroom. So it'd be um, a history lesson with a book that in some way related to the topic that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so we'd have to combine things together. And so if it was um, something from the 60s, you would try to find a book that defined the 60s, right, as an example. And that's kind of the vibe of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was always it was, it The was, Outsider by S.E. Hinton. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> it, it was, uh, I taught 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. Mostly, my biggest disappointment was that at that level, you're not really teaching anything. You are being told by the state, they have tests, they need to pass, and if they don't pass them, sure. they don't Ooh. graduate. So you need to teach to the test, which kind of sucks, because the kids had questions about, like, what was going on in the world, and you had to be like, sure, sure, sure. But have you ever talked about the XYZ affair? And they're like, what? And so it sucks. It sucks to have to do that. As an educator, I can completely relate to that. <laughs> and so I really, really appreciate you saying that. I, and I have found that in your videos, that same sort of curiosity really comes out. Oh, yeah. And stuff like, I, I, do you feel as though your history teacher background has lended itself to some of the stuff you do lore and uh, all of the deep dives you do in your videos yeah i think being able to um create lessons for one uh people who are 15 16 17 18 is uh something that i just had to learn to do mm -hmm. and it comes down to figuring out what exactly reaches people and the biggest thing I, I found out, you need to have that hook. You need to have some investment in what's going on. You need to get them interested in the topic you're talking about. One of my favorite things I always used to do is every time we talked economics, we get to scarcity. And every time, and boy, do they hate me for this, but I loved it. It was such a good lesson. That day, I'd bring in a bag of candy and just leave it there and be like, take some. Take as much as you want. And the first kids would take as much as they wanted. And by the end, there was no, the kids who got late, who definitely wanted the candy the most, they got none. And the, the point I was making is like, there's only so much candy. Like, and the, those guys took as much as they wanted. And obviously I'd be like, here, you can have some candy. It's fine. Yeah. But the, the lesson there was, and that was just the first five minutes of class. And it was just to get them talking about what had happened. And then it's like, oh, well that's called this. And now they have a memory of that's what this thing is. And like that kind of thing is the way I would do it. So try to translate that into videos and trying to be like, okay, we have to talk about, for example, the concept of astral and umbral in a video game that already is confusing. How on earth do we do this? And so you just break it down and chunk it. Like, here's what it is in the game this way. And then we get deeper and deeper to the point where the end of that video is literally just the concept of color theory. Mm. I mean, like, here's why sometimes every color makes black and why sometimes every color makes white and it's all perspective and how you see things. And that's the way it is in the game. And it's that kind of thing where you just have to be like, look, we're going on a journey and by the end you'll get it, but just come with me and let's go on this together. You always do your videos. You, like This is the way it is for a reason, right? Let's sure. explore what that reason is together in a way that's more fun and engaging. A lot of history, a lot of education, playing video games the whole time. Where did that kind of come in for you? Where did that love for video games start and how did it influence kind of what got you here? Well, I, I grew up in the uh, time period where Nintendo was the thing and every kid on the block had a Nintendo. And so I think because my parents wouldn't let me get one, I loved it even more. I wasn't allowed to have one I would always go over either. to friends' house. Yeah. My parents I would, would I had my, they would let us build a computer and if we had a computer and learned how to install games on it then we were allowed to play video games and that sure. was it. And they didn't know how yeah, expensive I, computers were going to be so it really wow. backfired on them. <laughs> yeah, my my parents had a computer but it was mostly for my mom's work. Yep. So any access I had to that computer was uh like a few games. I remember there was a game called DOS Boot where it was just like your sub commander. Yep. And that's and my dad liked it so I got to play it. Uh, even though to this day he swears he never played video games, but I watched that man with the Game Boy play Tetris way too much. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I had that, but I didn't have a Nintendo. And most of the time that resulted in like, all right, well, little Jesse's going to go on a 12-hour bike ride to the middle of nowhere and I'll be back later, parents. But uh, for most of it, I would just go to a friend's house and watch them play through Super Mario 3 or watch them do all that stuff. 
And it wasn't until Super Nintendo came out that I got one for Christmas. And I was like, yo, I was the first kid on the block to have one. Everyone come over. We played Mario World. It was great. And um, it was with the Super Nintendo that I found games like Final Fantasy. I love Final Fantasy VI. It was three at the time in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And fell in love with that and got to play with the Super Scope and do all that stuff. Loved it. I um, In our basement, there was like a little side room that I made into like Jesse's cool kid room. <laughs> and it had a, you know, like a little couch and the TV. And that was pretty much it in that room. Yeah. And we just like jump around and play games. Um, and I did that like a like a little psychopath through all of my youth and into high school and uh into college when i would sit in the dorms late at night playing starcraft oh, against yeah. randoms on the it was just uh, something that's always been a part of my life um even when i was down to just there's a period 2010ish where all i was playing was world of warcraft that was it mm -hmm. that's all i was mm -hmm. doing um and I definitely missed out on some games that I've had to go back and play since. Where I was like, how did I miss this? This is amazing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I it's always been a part of who I am and what yeah. I enjoy. It's sort of like a uh, escape from just the nonsense of having to do all the work I was doing. Even as a teacher, it's a lot. I don't want to spoil things for everyone who's like, you get the summers off. No, my friend, that does not. That's not how that works. No, so, it's not. You, you, it's, it's like a nice, okay, I'm going to shut down and just click some things or press some buttons and watch the colors and have a good time. Uh, rather than like, oh God, how am I going to teach this kid this thing? He's asleep in half the classes. What am I like? I, how do how do I reach this kid? Yeah. It's, you know, that kind of thing. And I just, I've done it ever since. And now it's my job. So I do it way more. <laughs> When you started making videos, like, were you still uh, a teacher at this point? Like, just kind of on the cusp, and then really turned it into something after um, the, uh, the the loss of that job. Yeah, I uh, I started making uh, Warcraft content. Um, literally, just that. So when I played WoW initially, when it first came out and stuff, I was in a really hardcore raiding guild. Yeah. And I just, it was towards the end of college for me. And so it was like, this is what I'm doing. I love this. We're going eight hours a day sometimes trying to yeah. learn this fight. Eventually that had to stop, obviously. But I realized that I still was doing raiding content, but kind of like barely knowing what I was doing, but we were still doing it. And so I started making videos that were like, if I can do this, Clearly, you can do this. Here's how yeah. you beat this boss. And I wanted to help people do that. So that's kind of what the first videos were. And then uh, I started doing like little play three things in my yeah. spare time. Okay. And it wasn't until much later that I actually wasn't teaching anymore. I was like, well, I guess this is what I'm doing now. What do you find meaningful in the work that you do? The videos that you make, obviously, you enjoy doing it because you keep doing it. You seem like the kind of guy that really tries to focus on things that are fulfilling for you and kind of you derive some meaning from and if you didn't then you wouldn't be doing it anymore right. um, uh, so tell me a little bit about what it means to you to get to do this and what you love about this kind of work that you get to do uh i think being able to uh create things has always been a part of me that i really want to nurture and uh continue to do even if it's one of those things where people are like you're not going to make any money doing this thing. I was doing this before <laughs> there was money involved. It's just part of who I am. I like to uh, come up with an idea, put it out there, mm -hmm. and let people be like, it's good or bad, but I just did it. It's done. Um, I always have things up here that I'm like, I got to make that, or else I will go crazy if I don't create this thing. Um, and I guess there's different sides of me. So sometimes I'll create content that's just pure silly goofery. And sometimes I'll create content that is more of a, here's a lorry or a historical thing or that kind of stuff. Sometimes I'll, years and years and years ago, I made a video um, called Jesse Explains America Black Friday. And it was, it's, I don't know, maybe five minutes. It's just me trying to explain to people. And it, there's no follow-up. There's no anything else. There's no series Jesse Explains America. It's just, this is what Black Friday was. And uh, the whole point was like, I can't explain it. Like, <laughs> the, the goof at the end is like, I don't have an explanation for this. People just would gather and yeah. fight over like an already way too expensive TV that they pretended was cheaper. Like it's, oh. it's crazy. Yeah. Someone and, got um, bit in a Walmart over a tickle me Elmo. Yeah. And... Yeah. If anything, I would make a video now. That's like, what happened to that? We just all collectively decided that sucked and now no one does that anymore, but is it because it sucked or is it because companies were like, Hey, what if we do a Thursday thing? What if we do a week thing? Oh, yeah. What if we do yeah. a whole month? 
-hmm. And so, I, I, yeah, that's a whole other video to make. <laughs> but it's that kind of place where I was just like creating to create. And sometimes it would get history side Jesse. And sometimes it'd be like wacky, goofy yeah. Jesse. And um, it's just kind of whatever I feel. And thankfully, I'm blessed that I have an audience who's like, man, whatever works for you, we'll watch. And that's so, so it's, cool. I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, that's one of the challenging things about having an audience um, that's like, you know, they can be on board for a certain campaign or topic or series or something and then jump at the next one. Um, it's very unlike what we do in the classroom where you have a captive audience. And it's like, right. how do I make this interesting for them? Because they're going to be there no matter what, because they're forced to. But like so somehow you have been able to um, kind of gather groups of people that are just interested in what what's he going to do next and stuff. Um, and we we have so many creators and, and people that are trying to ask us and talk about what they think is kind of that secret sauce of some uh, of sorts. What do you credit? Why do people watch your content, do you think, if you had to put a, a, a word to it or phrase? I imagine at this point, it's mostly people who uh, are either one in Final Fantasy in that space, two mm -hmm. have just watched so long that I'm now a part of their life, oh, yeah. three... Yeah pure nostalgia <laughs> or or four they stumble upon it and they're like oh this seems interesting but i uh I, I think the biggest thing is that the space right now is really crowded mm -hmm. there's a lot of youtube and twitch and content creation going on and it only gets more and more and more crowded as time goes on and so uh f new people coming in i think i just stopped concerning myself with like how do i get new people to watch what do, um just because one, my audience skews older anyway. Um, I've always, for the for the vast majority of my time being here, uh, everyone usually thinks like 13 to 17 or 18 to 24 is the vibe. 24 to 35 is where I operate at. It's yeah. been that way for years. And um, that's just, it's like a different experience. I'm not trying to like get the skibbity riz or whatever the hell people are into <laughs> the skibbity I'm, riz you know, i'm you know, so yeah. glad you said that on this podcast <laughs> Did, um, that's a wrap I'm, you know i'm trying to i got we you nice. it. i got you I'm automatically for the yeah, yeah. choose the algorithm thank you yeah, for yeah, that yeah, yeah. Yeah. and i i'm not in that space i'm doing something yeah. totally different and so um i understand that there's a need to get new eyes and new people invested but most of that comes from younger spaces and people who are like oh this is interesting I'm just doing this because it's what I love to do. And yeah. uh, if, you know, I can do it forever, great. If not, that's fine too. I'm going to keep doing the things I enjoy because I learned a long time ago. I'm not going to chase trends or do any of that. It mm. is so exhausting and I just don't have the patience for it anymore. I'm like, nah, dude, I'm too old for that. So, yeah, I, I just kind of hope that me liking something will translate into, oh, that person seems to enjoy the thing that I do. I'll watch rather than what do people want and how can I do that? Right. It's, it's, it seems like a fool's errand to do that. You talked uh, about your good friend, um, John Bain, right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, yep. who, Total Biscuit. And some folks may not be familiar. Um, and I know that he passed away in 2018 and he had, was really impactful on a lot of people. Um, I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit and explain to folks kind of who he was, but more who he was to you um, and sure. how uh, it contributed to kind of who you are today. And uh, I just I'm really curious uh, because we watched his videos all the time. All my friends. I mean, he just was the first one to be so witty and direct and charming. And maybe it was just the accent. Right. But you can tell me what what the truth is behind it. <laughs> The accent does do a lot of carrying. I've noticed this. <laughs> to all my Brits out there, you are lucky. You are winning. Or you've got like a few feet ahead of us. Um, but uh, John, like sh with zero same shame, I will say this. John is the reason why I have a career. I think it's very safe to say that had I not been a part of the Co-Optional Podcast or the, the Polaris Podcast, TGS Podcast, or whatever the hell we call it in our various iterations, I would not be as successful as I am today. Uh, I definitely would still be doing this to some extent, but nowhere near where I'm at. And uh, I wouldn't have met as many people and had as many opportunities without him. Um, he was kind of like a force on the internet at the time where he just was the guy who was like, I'm going to tell you about a thing. And even if it's 25 minutes of me complaining about FOV sliders, I will 
make sure you hear about this new game or issue or whatever. And uh, he very much came across as like an authoritative figure. The best part is, is knowing him behind the scenes is just a goofball. One of my uh -huh. favorite people, just complete. It's very funny to me when people um, have this impression of him as being extremely serious and very uh, like confrontational. It's like, here's what I think about this. And uh, totally different outside of camera, just like a very genuine, nice person. Oh, cool. uh, absolute joy to be with. In fact, 90% of the time, my whole job I felt was to make him not only laugh, but break the like yeah. cynical Brit persona and right. just be himself. And it's all I wanted to do. And so you can <laughs> see it sometimes I would definitely get him and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I felt really good about it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's one of those things where I think WTF is and all those different shows that he was working on were a pretty fundamental uh, component of what not just YouTube videos are, but what YouTube criticism is of mm. other things. And so, yeah, I understand why he had such an impact on people and uh, especially myself. So like, I get it. Yeah. It... How long did it take him to cook up these video ideas? Great question. I would say for the most part, I feel like he pressed record and just went. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, but a thing would happen and then a video would be up. And I don't know if he spent all day working nonstop doing it or if he just was like, record 40 minutes later, he's like, and now I'm done. Genuinely do not know. The I, man I, was a mystery to me. I feel like he came out of the womb and he was like complaining about the check-in process at the hospital with like snarky humor and like great criticism, maybe just because he heard sure. his mom talking about it or something. Like he just had that kind of natural vibe to make you laugh and say some things that were really serious and really made you think. But then right when you're almost done processing, he hits you with another one out of nowhere. And the pacing on the things that he did was just, it was just incredible. We, it was, we all tried to imitate his voice. None of us could do it. And uh, it, it's still re reminiscent of how a lot of my close friends and I will jabber about video games today. You know, the high paced, high intense, uh, like level of discussion. And we, you know, we just love each other. And he kind of gave us that permission to be critical but loving of something at the same time absolutely is that accurate to his personality and, and what did you experience as you worked with him oh he was pure snark and i'm totally fine with that uh one of our dear friends crendor he would just rib him ruthlessly constantly one of my favorite uh dinner memories is we all went out to dinner at this very fancy steakhouse it was beautiful but crendor shows up in like sweatpants and a t-shirt that was his own merch and so <laughs> sitting down to order was hilarious everyone's dressed up and he like rolls it and the entire time job was just like over and over hitting him <laughs> again and again but like it was purely out of love because we all know who Crendor is as yeah. a person and we know he was gonna do that we just couldn't believe it happened we were like <laughs> it was so funny and uh that kind of experience where it's just uh friends hanging out is like the best memories I have. Yeah. But I will say going back to his videos, um, I think he was gifted the ability to just talk, not just mm. fluently, but in a way that seemed effortlessly that I think so many people do not have access to. There are many people on YouTube that do have that where they can sit there and it seems like words come out and they sound like the exact word it needs to be at the exact time, sure. the exact pace. That is not a skill I have. I will stumble over myself. I will sit there. If you watch old co-optional podcasts, I'm trying to think of like, how do I say the thing I want to say? He just had it. And again, I don't know if that was the secret behind it was he had sat down and wrote out an amazing script beforehand and was like, I'm in the zone. Or if he genuinely made it just come out and this is what he had to say. Either way, an incredible talent either way. So I love the mystery behind it. I think that's yeah. one thing that really has set my conversations with Wade uh, apart over the years is talking around something deeply, digging into it and getting frustrated with the like knowledge that we're never going to know and then helping each other learn to accept that it's just fun and it's a little more fun to wonder together because you're not trapped right. in this kind of prison of your own mind. Wade, as we kind of start to transition into some kind of Final Fantasy talk and things like that, do I have time to ask about Monster Prom? Oh, you got to. We, we got to talk about Monster Prom. Do you mind? Prom, please. Do you mind? Okay. 
Can I have the origin of where the idea came from? Uh, so I, in 2017, um, played a, an early alpha version of Monster Prom. And uh, it was done by the beautiful Glitch team. They were amazing. And I messaged them like, how can I help this become a reality? Oh my God, I would love to be involved. And um, from that point on, we, we worked together. I, uh, I, as a producer, helping fund different things. And uh, at that point, it was just kind of like, okay, Here's my one mandate. I don't care what you guys do. This is what I want. I have for a long time aspired to, sorry to make this the crassest interview ever. I have sometime aspired to the theory of Overwatch. And Overwatch is a game I don't think sold as a shooter, but as a pseudo dating sim and that there is a character for everyone to fall in love with. <laughs> oh mm. yeah, okay. And normally that's not how I describe it. It's a little more swear wordy, but there's something for everyone there. Yeah, and I was it. like, and I was like, I need that in this game. We need to have a character <laughs> that everyone, cause the game is monster prom. You want to date these characters, take them to prom. Yeah. Even though it's a competitive game, yeah. it's a goofy game. It's a game where you're like playing with your friends and you're making stupid voices and yep. you're trying to like screw each other out of going to prom. But there needs to be someone for everyone to really fall in love with and want to go. Yeah. So every character needs to hit that thing for someone. And as the franchise has grown, there are more and more of those where there's something for everyone. Yeah. So it's not only are you playing a character, but you're also going to pick one to hang out with. And then like when they show up again, you're like, yo! So that's kind of where I was. I was like, I don't care what y'all do. You're doing great so far. Yeah. Just give me that. And they succeeded, I think, tremendously. And it's absolutely what I love about it. They did a great job. Now, did they have to encrypt the character models for Monster Prom as well, like they did with Overwatch and tried to do? Or is <laughs> No, if anything, we have been like, please, enjoy. Go fan artists. <laughs> Live your life. We don't care. If someone wants to start making source filmmaker versions of our characters, mwah, go. Have fun. We love you. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, the more about the studio that created Monster Prom? Um, and I sure. think I think they deserve a lot of credit, which you've already you oh, know, started completely. to give. But yes. I, just and I realized that I didn't follow my own rule. One of my jobs on the show is to make sure that everybody kind of has the same groundwork of knowing what something is before we just run off and talk about it. And so Wade is probably like, "Oh my gosh, he didn't do the context." I thing. know. Listen, I was over here saying you like. <laughs> You always have to be like, hey, break down this thing about Final Fantasy because not everybody knows that. And all of a sudden, I'm like, hey, Evan, not everybody knows about Monster Prom, my brother. <laughs> so Monster yeah. Prom oh, is... I a will gladly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. why don't you... Ex I would love for you to explain the concept yeah, of what please. it is. Um, and then just sure. tell us a little bit about like the creativity that you experienced with that studio. Uh, and then a little bit maybe about their process that you thought was pretty special. Sure. So uh, first off, just giving the studio as much love as possible. Uh, Beautiful Glitch is a Spanish studio. They're incredible. Uh, my dear, dear, sweet, sweet friend Julian is a just one of the, uh, the best way to describe it is every character is based off someone he knows. Oh. That, anything about him as a person, right? So uh, in my mind, I see him just like at a club somewhere getting ideas. Um, the entire team from writers to artists to uh music is just so well done and we have created everything from uh stories that are incredibly goofy and very vulgar to stories that are pretty existential in our most recent game road trip there is an ending that is like designed to make you cry and so we have done a lot of really cool things with it at breaking fourth walls, all that kind of stuff. But Monster Prom as a property is a conceit that um, in a world of monsters where instead of uh, Pokemon, they're a Pokemon and it's just like a dude going to work, like businessman is one of the cards you would draw. Like that kind of vibe where it's just a flip of reality. Um, but also nothing's taken seriously. So for example, there is a character, Polly, who is a ghost. And you may say, well, if they're monsters, who's the ghost of? Don't ask questions, this is what I'm saying to you. Who cares where that ghost came from? In fact, no one does. The whole point is that every single time she talks about when she died, it's a different story of how she died, very similar sure. to like the Joker in Dark Knight. It's just a different story every time. Who knows? And so there's, uh, you know, uh, devils and vampires and werewolves and uh, gorgons and all sorts of stuff in this world. And the story we're telling is it's just a spooky high 
and you're trying to go to prom. <laughs> And the whole thing is all these monsters who are just terrible because they're monsters, they're terrible people, oh, yeah. but they all love each other. And you're trying to go to prom with one of them. And so there are characters that you can play as. And the whole thing is think of it like a dating sim, but multiplayer. And it's designed to be played with friends so you can screw them out of dates. So if the three of us were playing and we yep. all wanted to go on a date with one person, not only would we have to have the right stats, we'd have to uh, do things you know, woo them in some sort of fun way, but then also ensure that the other two do not. And at the end, it's revealed who goes to prom. And uh, sometimes you can just go by yourself. Sometimes you don't go at all. Sometimes you end up in the orgy ending. Who knows? But it's it's there's many ways to do it. And so there's Monster Prom, then the sequel Monster Camp, which was just, you know, you're at camp. And then Monster Road Trip, which was more of a choice-based navigate around a map and different things change your direction. And then the next one coming soon, Monster Con, which is a convention. So, Oh, oh wow. Okay. Are you allowed yep. to talk about that at all? Because this idea of a dating sim that crashed into Mario Party and it just works and is hilarious uh, really yes. has played. So anything that we're allowed to know about the new one? Anything that uh, surprised Monster Con, you about just the imagine new one? the exact same idea of uh, going to convention, seeing all the different booths, getting caught up in convention shenanigans but at the same time it's some of it's some of the different characters from the previous one some new characters okay um and they all go to a convention together and the idea is you're just trying to like hook up at the convention man but obviously it's going to be wacky and silly and the whole real true premise is to make you laugh that's the from the base conceit of the game is it's just supposed to be fun and if you play it with other people and you do it on stream or you play it with friends and you make up silly voices for the characters um, getting you. Like, you know, you oh, do yeah. a thing and then the next thing you know, it's goofy as hell. Like, a great example is in Road Trip, one of the towns you visit is being attacked by a giant kaiju and you have three options on how to deal with it and one of them is straight up just like, make a giant mech, right? And you're like, yeah, we're going to fight it. <laughs> of course. But by making a giant mech, you, the, the kaiju falls in love with you. And so now you have the option <laughs> of like, all right, are we hooking up with this? Is this, is this happening right now? And that's kind of where you can go with it, right? That's, <laughs> it's like, screw it. Let's have fun. That's, that's the whole vibe. And it's amazing. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I thank you for sharing about it. I won't ask any more Monster Pump questions, Wade. <laughs> I no. promise. Well, now I have so many questions. This thing could go on forever. I mean, after Monster that is the Con, point. you've got, like, I, w I want Monster University, though you might have to fight Disney for that. Um, but, like, <laughs> that would be fun. Monster Suburbs? Monster Neighborhood? As yeah. your audience ages? Like, those of us that live, like, in certain areas, it's like, okay, how can we yeah. screw over our neighbors? And, like... And I think it's a it's a great canvas to create other things. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it is. Different ways of gameplay. There was one that we had talked about before that is still kind of like existing, but not really, which is more of a, um, uh, it, it's like a snowball fight version where mm. two of the main characters who have always butted heads uh, sort of divide everyone and it becomes a different experience, a different type of game. Okay. And so there's different ways to do things, but it's very clear that for the most part, people really like just getting with friends together and playing sort of the Mario Party version of, yeah. we're gonna get together tonight and we're gonna spend two hours doing this thing. It's gonna be absolutely goofy. And that's that's where we're at. And I'm perfectly happy to offer it to the world. Yeah, yeah, more to come. It's an amazing well, thing that's... to be able to inject in people's lives. Like, yes, unexpected joy and like common shared memories to be able to talk together is an awesome thing to be able to give to people digitally. And uh, my friends and I at least are very appreciative of uh, the studio and you for your work on it. Thank you. It comes through. We've had a great time with it. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, uh, I also get to do the voice acting, which I love and uh, spoilers. I get to do some pretty amazing voices like bowl of salad oh. and snake with lisp. All sorts of good ones. I like it's fantastic. I really it's perfect. <laughs> you have a favorite character voice. Uh, in the upcoming one, I play one of the characters you can pick. He's a big old blob boy, and he's a sweetheart. So, oh, can I? Can you give us a taste? Yeah, can I? Can yeah? Could you want me to you've feed been a line? It. You've 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 had oh, the taste. Oh, we did get it. Oh, okay. this is yeah. This is the voice. It's just me. <laughs> this is the first time. It's just yeah. Usually I'm like doing like hey, I'm doing the thing. But this is just straight up. Just it's me. Uh, so. It's very. You know, it's probably the best role I've ever had. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> the most authentic for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's great. Well, one of, one of the things that I love about your content, the what I'm loving about um, the, this game series, and I really do hope that you would consider a monster college one. Come on down to Bama. I'll take you to the fraternity and sorority houses. Monster You'll understand Rush? the drama. Oh my, Monster oh my Rush God. would be amazing. Monster Rush is a fantastic <laughs> idea. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> okay, come on down to Bama. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll make it work. Um, but what, what I love about this is that you do create communities around the content that you have created, right? Whether it's um, listening to a lore video from Final Fantasy XIV, or whether it's Geek Enders, or your Unsolved Mysteries of Final Fantasy VII Remake, that video, all of it is so invitational, where you're having a conversation with people through the screen and they feel like they know you. Um, and that's one of, that. that is something that, that, people practice so much to try to do. And for you, it seems just very, very effortless. Um, maybe it's from the theater background, maybe it's history. I don't know, um, but it is, uh, it, it's remarkable. So I did want to comment on that. And it, have you found that there have been pockets of communities that have kind of surprised you in the, the content that you've created? Uh, I mean, I think it's surprising to see how genuinely, and mm. uh, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, there are holes in everything, but genuinely and generally, Final Fantasy XIV has been very welcoming mm. and super chill. Um, I love talking with them about stuff. For the most part, I think conversational discussion and things that I do um, is really kind of based off the fact that I can't do what, for example, John did. I can't sit there and be hypercritical. I cannot review to save my life. It is not something I do. When I do reviews, it's me just being like, here's some wacky stuff. I just like, eh, I was playing this and it made me think of this and this is the thing. It's really just reflections on things rather mm. than like, here's my thoughts. I wouldn't trust me on a review. I don't necessarily know how to do a review well. Mm. I would say I have opinions and thoughts that I think I can get across that people uh, will relate to. And by all means, um, please continue to support that. But yeah, if I was to give you, you know, mechanically why something doesn't work or why I think this feature is terrible, it's not really something I particularly care too much about. Uh, again, like I said way in the beginning, I'm really here for the story. I'm here to experience something. I want to go on an, an adventure or some sort of like experience with the game rather than you know, concern myself with the settings or, you know, how long it took to beat a boss or what the, uh, you know, difficulty spikes were, things like that, that people genuinely care about that I uh, can't really critique in a way that would seem natural, let alone authentic. So I just won't do it. And that forces me to do this, where we just talk about things rather than, uh, you know, sit here and, you know, like, pontificate on what was great about this game compared to the previous one, which was by far uh, a lesser example of the game. I just can't do that. I couldn't even do it right then. <laughs> yeah. Well, get ready because we're about to do that with Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're going to be okay. Real quick, though, briefly, how did you find that style? You talk about differentiating yourself from kind of John's style. Was there a process that was involved? We have a lot of people who listen and watch who are very creative and have a lot of questions about how to find themselves, their style. Wade deals with it in the classroom a lot, helping people kind of figure out what those forks in the road are for sure. them. What was it for you? And maybe what advice would you give based on your experience to people who are kind of on that journey? Trial and error. Just do it. And if it works for you, great. And if it doesn't, try something else. Hmm. Find the things that you feel comfortable with, even if the video isn't a huge success. If you put it out and you are completely satisfied with the product you created, then that, that tells you something hmm. about not only yourself, but also what your expectations of yourself are. And... Uh, just keep, you know, once you're in that space, then tweak that and keep trial and erroring until you get there. But no matter what, you're going to create and you're going to make something new. And the whole process of creation is continuing to make something new and something fresh and something that is both who you are, but also kind of like reaching out a little bit and extending and trying to do something different. And sometimes you land it. And sometimes people are like, what is this? <laughs> and that's fine. It's totally fine to not do well on something. There's been times where I've done videos that have gotten millions of views and sometimes where no one watched that video and it's totally okay. It's super fine to do that. 
Uh, you just have to learn that it's it's all right, and you're just still all right. On to the next one. You put something out. I think maybe that's from auditioning oh. when you would audition for voice roles or whatever. You that's send good. it and forget it because if you think about it, you'll stress over it, and who knows what the company or the the studio is thinking because in their mind they know what they're already looking for. Oh mm. sure. And so you're just one of thousands of people potentially who are sending a thing and if you're not immediately what they're looking for they're just boop in the trash and that's fine you just keep sending it and then eventually you will get something and that's just the process for everyone i think that's the same thing with youtube is just keep creating yeah. and doing it over and over it's consistency it's about creating a foundation where most people i think are more like me there are some people on youtube who they make three videos and have five million subs, and they're the best people you've ever seen. Oh, they're so talented. But most people create stuff, and it takes time. You build an audience slowly over time. More and more people join. Uh, it took me 10 years to get a million subscribers. So, like, mm. you know, I'm clearly not in any rush, and I <laughs> feel like many people – think oh my god yeah. i should be i've been making videos every day why are right. people watching sometimes it just takes one video and suddenly you have an audience mm -hmm. and it just happens and you won't know why and you'll just be like i don't know why people watch this but like thank you and then then you go from there but just keep creating keep, keep making stuff and uh try different things and see what works for you Wait, I saw your eyes perk up at the same statement, and I'm wondering if you have a similar <clears throat> follow-up. Do you want to ask yours? That then? idea that, that you bring up of um, send it and forget it. You know, as soon as you, um, you create something, you put it out in the world, you're satisfied with it. You can't linger on it too much. You really remind me, and I was, I was going to ask if you had read this book. Um, there's a book out by Rick Rubin, um, who founded um, like uh, Def Jam Recordings and all that yep. kind of stuff, a book called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. And in this, it's like uh, reflections on um, the art of creation. And one of the things that he says is when you put something, there it is right there. Wait, when you put copy. something out <laughs> into the world, <laughs> when you put it out into the world, um, it's done. And you can't right. linger on it. You, the, 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 the finished product is what it is, and you can't change it. And I, I think back to some of my earliest videos, shoot, maybe a video I put out a week or two ago, and I'm like, ah, oh, I would do this differently or that sound effect or something like that. But you just send it and forget it. I love that. That's very freeing. Freeing to me, and I hope it's freeing to, to all of our viewers, to my students that are listening, maybe for homework that I've required <laughs> for you, whatever it is. <laughs> sure. um, but yeah, no, that's that's really, really compelling stuff. Um, did you ever have a video that you put your heart and soul into? And you were like, oh man, why didn't this catch? Like this caught me, why didn't it catch them? So often. I yeah. can't even express to you how many times I've created something where it's been a passion project of mine. I put it out. No one cared. And then on the flip side, a video that I spent an hour working on, like maybe just me reacting to a thing. Yeah. And it blew up. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem fair at all. <laughs> but it is what it is. And uh, yeah, I, I although I haven't read the book, I've seen so many interviews. Mm. And the idea still comes across. The idea of just being like, yeah, I, I made a thing. I put my passion into it and my energy and uh, it's made. It's like, it exists. It's its own thing. And I will say frequently, I'll put out a video that I don't think does very well. And then I'll go back a year later and somehow it has numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know when that occurred. I don't know how people found it. It wasn't on my radar anymore. I was not thinking about it. And suddenly it's got a bunch of people watching it. And I'm like, oh, it just somehow happened. And yeah, yeah it goes against algorithmically which i hate algorithms oh boy but it goes mm -hmm. against the idea of youtube's all about in the first hour you have to have this many views and after that the first day in order yeah. to get eyes on it and have it sent to people you have to have this many people watching it and sometimes that doesn't happen for me frequently that doesn't happen but it's also because my audience skews differently mm -hmm. and they're older they got stuff to do man yeah. so when yeah. they finally have free time to watch it may be two three days later maybe five days maybe a week later yeah. And by that point, I'm already on to another project. I'm thinking of something else. So I'm not even looking at that. So when mm. I eventually see it show up on my feed, I'm like, okay, mm. <laughs> I'm glad people watch that. And it's something that I think is, uh, you know, just something you learn to do. I don't know that you can do it right away. I feel many people, when they create a thing, they're going to obsess over the thing they created. I know I did. 
years and years ago, but I've been doing this for 15 years. Right. So, you know, at this point, I'm like, nah, just ship it and let's go. Let's move on to something else. Otherwise, you would, one, go crazy about something you already did, and two, focus on something you already did without creating something new, and that just stops the whole creation process. That makes total sense. And this, I have one more follow-up, and then I'll wait. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you <laughs> loose on him with the Final Fantasy. He's <laughs> um, like keeping me at the gate. So like, yeah, I'm holding him back. <laughs> let me in! <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, you, can't make me laugh. Uh, you said a statement. Uh, you said it tells you what your expectations of yourself are, and you said mm. it very casually, and it fell out of your mouth like that's something that everyone says all the time. But it seems like that's something that kind of is something that you've developed that you speak. Is that something that you were spoken to that you picked up on? Um, and what do you mean by that? And what does it mean to you? Well, I think learning not only about who you are, but about the sort of level at which you want to operate is very important. I think we see YouTube as the most successful people that exist. When you go on YouTube, oh, sure. the front page, if you are not signed in to your own stuff, the stuff you see are multi bajillion view videos by people who are incredibly successful who will make more money than I will ever see and they sort of set this bar of what you can expect and I think that is a complete fallacy and people fall for it frequently it's the same idea of when you think of a football player or an actor or you only see the most successful people yet there are thousands and thousands millions of people trying to do the same thing who are doing it but not at that level, but they're mm. still happy and satisfied and finding a way to just accept what you want for yourself, I think is very important. And it requires a lot of like, I don't know if ego death is the right word, but it requires a lot of just being like, I will never be that guy. That guy, uh, lucked out. It was a fluke that that person did that. Or as I've learned, many people just have, advantages going into it. Like there are many people who do YouTube that they started as like the kid of someone famous who we don't really know, but they've got a lot of money so they can throw money at a video and make it pop. Like there's mm -hmm. things that we don't see happening or they could have behind the scenes shenanigans going on that, you know, they have 15 editors and a whole, like there's a whole variety of things. So focus on what you can do and what successes you can create. And if your success is, I made a video and people commented on it and we had a really good discussion, then that's a win, right? If you yep. make a video and you spend six weeks on this video and you put it out, the fact that you got it out and it wasn't just sitting on your desktop for six weeks, that's a huge win. And, and appreciating those moments uh, is very important mm. that I think is something you have to learn and sort of uh, acclimate to. You can't just assume you're gonna be famous and assume it's going to be a job. If anything, I started this as a like a hobby for fun. Mm -hmm. And so money being included was something I was not even remotely expecting. And when it happened, I was like, this seems kind of like a scam. <laughs> yeah, how, how is this happening? Yeah. And the fact that I've still been doing this all these years later is genuinely shocking to me. I still fundamentally don't understand why anyone cares what I have to say about things, why I'm on, like the fact that I'm on here and we're about to talk about like some things I'm not qualified to speak on. I can't Quantum believe mechanics. that's happening. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that's happening, but I'm here for it because I love talking about it. And the fact that I am uh, lucky enough to do this always seems amazing to me. And that's why I appreciate it as much as I do. And um, yeah, it's just one of those things that I think you need to set expectations for yourself and you need to be real with yourself about what you can achieve and not think this next video is going to be the 18 million view video. Mm -hmm. Like, no, just create a thing. And if it becomes that, awesome. But then what are you going to do after that? Where do you go from there? You can't just be the guy who made that one video because, all right, cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. but where do you go? Like, what do you do after that? There's it's not really an Tomorrow identity. is another day. Yeah. There will be more days. So where do you go from there? What do you create? Who are you? as a creator or as a person in this space. You, and and I, I think I'm very fortunate enough that I at least staked out my little area and I, I have that. I'm so glad that you said all of that because in all the conversations that I have with content creators, you know, um, you, you talked about, you know, there's people on the front page that like you can only fathom of, of what imagining what it's like to be 
in that space. And, and I want you to know, like so many people consider you that kind of person, that kind of creator. Okay. And like <laughs> you, you're like one of the most down to earth dudes I think I've ever met in my life. Even in LA, you know, at the final fantasy 16 event, I walked up to you and you had a real conversation with me. Like I, I didn't have a YouTube channel, anything like that. You just, a you treated me like a person, not a viewer, which is amazing and a huge credit to you. But the fact that you would say, yeah, there's these people and all, who do you look up to mm. in content creation space? Who inspires you? Oh, man. Um, this is going to sound crazy, but going back to uh, the conversation we had about going out to dinner and Crendor yeah. showing up in so – that man inspires me in ways I cannot stress. <laughs> uh, he has clearly made the decision that he's going to do – the content he wants to create, not worry about what anyone thinks. No. And he's going to live the life he wants to live in a way he chooses rather than chase mm. things. And do. He has grounded me in a way that I cannot stress. When I think like, man, this, oh, this isn't going to work or this is stupid or I'm doing. He is like, here's my idea. I discovered that uh, on Twitch, the first two hours of a stream is when you get the most subs and the most interaction and the most views. So I do two, two hour streams a day. Like, that is an idea. I was like, why would you do that? What's that idea? And he's like, well, I, I do one and then I go work out and I do walk and I spend time with my wife and I do stuff and then I'll do another one at night. And I'm like, that is so unintuitive to what the most creators uh -huh. think. It's like, I got to create and I got to make. He's like, I have chosen to live a life. Mm. And seeing that and being like, okay, that's where I need to be mentally is right. like, it isn't just, I'm going to sit in front of the computer and create all the time. It's I, I'm going to go out and do something. I'm going to like walk away for a little bit. I'm going to not stress over this. And it's very freeing yeah. <laughs> to just be like, you know what? No, not today. I'm going to spend all day today doing something completely different. So what is your day like? This is the last question on content creation. I promise. Sure. Then we are getting to Final Fantasy. But with all of these projects, all of it, like game design, you've done some stuff with YouTube um, and a, a show, the lore videos, not to mention your streams, what is your day to day like? Sure. Uh, well, you know, it's choice, I guess. Sometimes you'll notice I don't stream for like a week and a half, yeah. right? And I think I have an audience that accepts that. Um, I will make videos uh, whenever I feel the need to, but I do things that are like, this is, we're going to have something on Monday, we're going to have something on Friday, right? Mm. But for the most part, everything is sort of designed around the fact that, like, come five o'clock ish, I'm done. Mm. I'm done for the day. I'm going to okay. go home and do anything else but until then i'm going as hard as humanly possible so i'm just working and we're and like focused and then there's a cutoff and i'm just not gonna think about it and i don't want to deal with it anymore and so that's that's kind of where i'm at mentally i'm very fortunate enough that for example tiktoks um i don't understand them i never yeah. will i don't get the algorithms but i was like hey i'm gonna reach out to the internet and just ask are there any editors out there who are, mm -hmm. I don't know, 20, 21-ish who yeah. <laughs> would love to be a part of this? And I found a, a wonderful editor, and she nails it every time, right? Nice. I have a team here at the office now, thankfully, because I'm, I've been doing this long enough that I have a team that we can work and do things together mm. and create things. And and so I can, I can not just uh, focus on YouTube creation, but I can do the game stuff. I can yeah. be on a show. I can know that, you know, stuff's happening over there, but I can be here talking with you and yeah. not stress. And so this is one of those give and take things where I had to, as a person who edits, be like, okay, I'm going to let other people edit, even though it's going to stress me out. They're not going to do it the way I want it done, but they're going to do it a different way, which might actually be better and let that happen. And it's one of those things that it's happened over years. Like I, this wasn't the case. Uh, up until 2018, 2019, mm. this was not the case. I did not have a, like a big team. Mm. It wasn't until, I don't know, three, four years ago that it actually were, there's people here doing a thing. Mostly wow. it was just me by myself. Uh, or if I needed an editor, I had a friend who would come and help me edit, but like, that's pretty much what it was. And so now we have a whole thing and, um, yeah, I'm trying to do bigger, more crazy things and do more stuff. So if it seems like I'm everywhere doing everything now, it's because that's kind of the point is mm. I'm just like, yo, I'm going to inundate you with me. And if you <laughs> want something, I will be there. And if you don't, you don't have to watch it. It's totally fine. You don't have to see any of the podcasts or do anything that I'm on. Like there's something for everyone. Yeah. And it's just kind of the plan. 
And um, that's all while I'm also making games. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I'm just doing it because I like doing stuff. Well, and that, that whole message is not only an inspiration to me, but I'm sure it's an inspiration to everybody that's watching this, listening to it. So thank you for indulging us with the whole content creation side of things. That's absolutely amazing. And as part of this show, we want to highlight, highlight the creators behind the content, right? Everybody knows you for your content. And they know us for our content, but there's people on the other side of this. And we try to personalize and humanize um, and really get into that. All right, everybody, it is that time in the episode for our mini game stretch break. But before we get started, we got to hit that theme music. Three, two, one. Oh, we're, oh, 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 just the one I could have continued. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to have a solo? No, I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> we, we asked, we asked. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time of the episode where we get to know each other a little bit better. We have the wonderful Jesse Cox with us, as you've heard from the Hello. interview before. We also have our bingo wheel of vulnerability, which you can see on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Wade has our question for the week. What are we drawing from today, Wade? Today, uh, we are going to be using the Geek Therapy card deck for clients and therapists. 87 practices to improve thoughts, build insight, and take action in your life and de-stress. So, speaking of, let's take a little stretch break, everybody. Listener, wherever you are, get a little stretch, a little mindfulness activity. Jesse, very you wanna, mindful. Do you have anything very you want to get them to meditate on? Anything that they should think? A little oh. word of encouragement. Just rest meditate and on. <laughs> Getting some sleep tonight. Like, go to bed Ooh. an hour earlier. Oh, like, you know, what a good rest. idea. And by meditating, I mean just go to bed. Just go, go to sleep. <laughs> right now. Right now. Sleep. Just go to sleep. sleep. Right now. <laughs> right now. And you've all and been, go to bed early. <laughs> you've been hypnotized. All right. So in the bingo wheel of vulnerability, we have the numbers one through 50. Everybody's going to get to guess their number. Listener, we encourage you to guess a number right now. Jesse, we're going to let you go first as our guest. 18. 18 is the number. Wade. 32. I'm going to go 37. 37. Ooh. All right, Jesse, just tell me when and I'll grab one. Stop. Oh, it fell out. Oh, it fell on the floor. I have to find it. Worlds are merging and breaking. Oh, it's, oh. Maybe it's gone forever. No. Yeah, is this one of those like, we'll never know? No, we'll no, never I can't, know. I can't, I can't. You can't do this? Well, no, I, this is, this is going to be great. It's, a, it's gone this, forever, Evan. Just, wow. Just like the live stream, it may be real, it may not. They may this have... is guys. This what is never happened. This ball. <laughs> yeah, does it, did it? Is that ball real? Who knows? It's I... gone. We lost it. All right, it could I'm... be eighteen. It could be thirty-two. It could be thirty-seven. We all win and lose. There is a reality where we win and yeah. lose. I'm going hands and knees. Uh -oh. Oh, all right. knees. oh, he's going all the way. Okay, okay. He's this is down. Good. We lost him. This is this. This is the best <laughs> content you see. Like it really pe is. People strive for I can't moments find like it. this. It is gone. Was it even real? Did it even come out of there? Who I knows? don't think it ever existed. I think this it is... went into a wormhole, like forever gone. This, this is, is like the Matrix. Like things, mm -hmm. you know, we'll never know. We might also, have to a few moments later. This <laughs> <laughs> we are definitely gonna have a few moments later. This I okay. love this. This is great. This is the, the essence. This is pure quantum mechanics. This is great. It, it happened, you. but didn't. Okay, it, it bounced it's so off in... the thing into the desk, and then it hit off my side table, and then it... Now it's gone. Found it! Oh! oh. <laughs> oh. And the number is... 27! <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> so in this so, reality, we all lost. We all lost. So, no, maybe a listener one. It would have been so maybe much better. Listener. If, if it had been one that we had if won, it had been oh, one that man. we guessed, then that was the first. You could have thing. lied. Maybe the listener but... willed it to be twenty-seven. Yeah, Maybe they exactly. Did. Yeah. Maybe we won't have to a few moments later. It's... Here's the question: Was it twenty-seven when it was missing? Oh, when you couldn't see it, was it twenty-seven? Was it? Mm. All about perception and reality. <laughs> I'm gonna get a, a like a scientist is gonna be like, no, it was always twenty-seven, dude. It fell out. Of, it's twenty-seven. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say to you, scientists, what is science really? What is science? Yeah. What is it's science? It's the only things we understand currently. It could change. What is science but a pain in my um, report card? <laughs> <laughs> right? A blight in my history. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> All right, Evan. All right. I'm ready. Let me count out. 27. So, that was 27, right? Yeah. 20. Oh. 
Okay, here we go. Here is the question. Everybody, this one is focused on pop culture. Okay. So here oh is the question. What is one plot point from any work of popular culture that you would change? Oh, man. And how would it impact the work? Oh, what is man. one plot point from any work of popular culture that you would change, and how would it impact the work? I'm going to be really selfish with mine. Okay. Go for it. Why don't you start And it's off? just the first thing that came to head. And I know that I can change a lot of things, but I'm, this is not in service of anyone else. This is just in service of me. Okay. And this is, this is my selfish moment. And I, if you're listening to this and you haven't read Harry Potter, it's a small spoiler, but, or some would argue it's maybe not that small. I am not jiving with Hedwig the owl getting killed. Okay. That was a that was a big moment, traumatic moment. For Pointless. Hedwig and was adults. there for him from the start. She was really the true, I think, anchor that mm. like helped him to feel like he was safe. And as Fair. a kid who had moments where like a pet was that thing for you that just kind of like you didn't have anybody else that you could talk with or or just cry in the room in front of mm. or whatever it was, the fact that Hedwig died tore me to pieces. Pain. So if I could somehow. Resurrect that little owl from the live stream. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back. In a world, he sits on um, Zach's shoulders. Yeah, and I know that's probably a waste of cosmic power, but it means a lot to me. <laughs> probably. Probably because, yeah, you're All right, idiot. Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, what about you? Sure. In my, uh, what I would change, this is borderline a spoiler, but okay. again, I assume we're all cool with that. Uh, the movie Final Destination mm. is it is the beginning of a franchise in which death comes to claim those who have slipped out of its grasp. Here's the thing. In the first movie, there is a moment where the water kind of like goes up when it shouldn't. <laughs> and the implication is that there's like a supernatural element where like death is coming to get them. Yeah. Mm. That ceases kind of halfway through that movie and is not ever brought up in the rest of the movies. I would like that to come back. I love the idea of like a supernatural force being the one tracking them down and getting them. In fact, I can't remember the actor's name. There's a guy in the movie who like comes across as being the embodiment and that dude does not play a role. It's, it's incredibly flawed in my mind. I feel like 100% that death should have been a character that was like, you got away, you damn kids. <laughs> it would have been more fun. I thought that was the plot of the, the whole thing. They just got rid of it? Look, I mean, the plot was you would survive like an accident and, and then, then the you were intended to die, right? Yeah. Like that, yeah. it's absolutely right. what the plots of those movies were, but there was like an element to it that, again, there's one scene I vividly remember where like the water is yeah, going in the up bathroom a wall. Scene. Yeah, yeah, like it shouldn't do that. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And it made it feel like Oh, something's happening here. But then that never, usually it's like a dude, like, I'm going to lift weights above knives for some reason. <laughs> and then dead. And you're like, well, why would you, like, that's just stupid. And I guess they just came up with ways to make people die, which is some of them nailed it. Like, I can't drive behind a truck with wood anymore. Like, that the other day for me. I was like, that's uh -huh. my question is, do you think that water in the water bottle that went under the brake pedal was the same water from the bathroom? Mm. That would have been awesome. It would have made no sense. But if the beginning of the movie was <laughs> no like, sense. I love, I love buying bath water. If that was that character's trope, oh! then like, yeah, all right, that, that makes sense. Like, oh, that guy, what an idiot. But they would do things like that where it's more accidental, like the water bottle rolled under the thing or like something stupid happened rather than this creepy effect of the water coming like, oh yeah. boy, it's coming up the side. That's, Haunted that shouldn't water. happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want that. I would love that to yeah. happen. It won't. It's too late. But <laughs> it would have changed late. everything for me. I would have loved those movies. Well, if only. Yeah. Wait, okay. what about you? So for me, um, mine has to go with uh, The Walking Dead. And um, I was a big Walking Dead fan for like five seasons, six There's seasons. There's a lot of changes like you could make. <laughs> a lot of changes I could make. But the one that I really, really do wish that could have happened was the video game, The Walking Dead season one. I would like for that to intersect with the characters in a significant, substantial way in the TV. The show. Telltale game? Yeah, the Telltale game. Yeah. 
I loved Lee and Clementine, and I just sure. wish that I could have gotten a little bit better and in, in more integration in, into that real world. So I, I think it would have been really fun. Um, also, I think that Clem would have been a really interesting um, kind of torchbearer from, um, from when Carl dies. Oh. 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 I, I think that Clem really could have picked it up and run with it. So anyway, that, that's what I would change. Clem really liked that. She did like that. Thank you. All right, everybody, back to the episode. So, finally, the whole reason that we brought you here, it's finally fantasy. time to talk yeah. about Final Fantasy, um, and specifically Final Fantasy VII, VII Remake, and VII Rebirth. Uh, Jesse, real quick, tell us a little bit about your history with um, specifically the Final Fantasy VII franchise, but you can go into the full series if you'd like as well. Sure. So I'm just a big Final Fantasy nerd. I have been since I was a wee lad. I vividly remember going into a Myers in Dayton, Ohio, and seeing a PlayStation with a giant TV ad for uh, Final Fantasy VII. I must have watched that trailer a uh. hundred times when my parents grocery shopped. And I just would go over to the game section and s just stand there watching. Uh, I did not have a PlayStation until I don't even know when. Maybe, maybe 12th grade? Finally got one, and that was it. I was like, let's go. I'm doing this. And uh, played Final Fantasy VII and just fell in love. Mm. Uh, until that time, Final Fantasy III, VI was all I had, mm. and I played that game way too many times. I love that game. Great one um, to start with. <laughs> favorite it is, scene? It is favorite one scene? of the best ones. You have a favorite what scene? Uh, oh, man. I love the uh ghost train because um, sabin can suplex a ghost train and it might yes. be my favorite moment in a video game but obviously the opera and oh, yeah, i love yeah. ultros and i love uh everything about the floating island bit uh it's it's an amazing game there's so much to love there plus spoilers the second half is amazing the fact that it exists yeah. the audacity of them to do what they do in this game amazing so love that go play final fantasy 6 but Final Fantasy VII is a game that uh, is just visually, it looked completely different. It was so striking. The cinematics, everything about it at the time, uh, this has been 97, mm -hmm. I think is when it came out. Mm -hmm. It was. Incre just genuinely incredible experience. It's, it, considering I played it years afterwards, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a chance to play it immediately. So I played it years afterwards, still loved it. And then immediately jumped into Final Fantasy VIII after that. Shout out to Blockbuster Video. I rented Final Fantasy VIII there. So- uh, <laughs> We love it. We love <laughs> but, Blockbuster. Um, <laughs> it was it was a, uh, like, a, I don't know. It was, it, it's To say it is an experience is to put it lightly. Final Fantasy VII at the time was, something that you're just like, what the hell did I just mm -hmm. play? And um, I understand the obsession people have with it, especially the different characters, everything about it. I, I totally understand. Um, if anything, I am thankful that I was obsessed with all the different Final Fantasy, so I never really got too deep into when Final Fantasy VII was like, we're going to milk it for all it's worth. We're just going to mm. keep creating content. Yeah. And that's, yeah, yeah, sure, we're going to keep making movies and this and this. I... I was like, all right, I'll watch it once, but it wasn't too invested in that. I was still just thinking about like, oh, Final Fantasy IX's coming out, dude. Oh my God. So I was doing that instead. When it was like three years in a row, you had seven, eight, and nine, like almost exactly three years. And it was just like this, this deluge of all of this amazing journey and content and all this stuff. But seven really did kind of kick off this new trend of um, super cinematic, um, hyper immersive storytelling. So I, I wonder, even though I, you said you were in 12th grade and it was a few years older at that point, even then it hit you as this is something really special. What was it about the story, do you think, that really stuck with you at that age? Man, uh, I mean, I'm not even sure where to start here. I think mm. the idea of you, the heroes are eco terrorists. The uh, villains are, uh, at the start, a giant corporation. The main villain is like some guy who may not even be real. The concept of uh, uh, the live stream was super interesting. Mm -hmm. I think the weapons was cool. The idea that uh, I vividly remember, I'll never forget this. The idea of starting in Midgar and playing the game 
and then at a certain point it boots you into an overworld map yes. that difference was jarring it was like what and having that all be in one game not to mention they gave characters sort of adult stakes even final fantasy 6 is great and there's a lot of mm -hmm. adult content in that game but a lot of the time the characters are like goofy mm -hmm. and in seven there's some goofy moments but all the characters are pretty adult even the goofy ones have like there's some messed up stuff going on there and it was a real story design not just for children to play which i think was the vibe of especially in the 90s this is video games this is what video games are mm -hmm. and and it was during this time period especially in the run-up to that so if you think about it it's like i think it was 92 93 94 maybe it was 94 95 96 whatever the case may be they did uh Crown Trigger, Secret of Mana, and Final Fantasy VI all mm -hmm. together and one like one after the other after the other. And all those games are super like, let's get you to think for a little bit. Especially yeah. Chrono Trigger. It's like, hey kid, how do you feel about time travel? Seriously. And paradoxes. Yeah. <laughs> you never experienced that stuff. And then immediately followed up with Final Fantasy VII, which is we're gonna make a very cinematic, extremely yeah. uh engaging story that's gonna deal with the whole other thing. I don't know how, uh, in fact, I was like, I don't know how they're going to top this. Then the next game, they were like, Child Warriors. <laughs> child <laughs> I was like, Warriors, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah like, All right. No, seriously, I, I've never really thought of it that way, how they almost um, equipped us and trained us from Secret of Mana um, to Six, um, even uh, to a degree Xenogears, even though I think that came right. out after Seven. But you start to really get this, this deeper sort of thing where the series and these games grew alongside us. You know, mm -hmm. our mental capacity grows, so does the game. And I think that that's why so many of us kind of cherish these mm -hmm. games because it felt like age-appropriate development for each one of us as we went through life. <laughs> kind yeah, of an interesting it, thought. I've never thought of it that way. It, it didn't really talk down to you. No. In fact, there are many times as a kid, I clearly misinterpreted what was going on and then mm -hmm. coming back later being like, whoa, yeah. how did I miss? Again, Final Fantasy VII has an entire scene where all the characters are dressing up to go like hang out with his dude at his house. And as a kid, you're like, yeah, I'm going to dress up cloud so we can like get a date. And then this, that scene is dark. It the is more you dark. Think, you're like, Whoa. It and is I'm, I'm glad that that remake recontextualized that. And like, yeah. Oh no, it's a, like, this is not cool at all. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and seeing that was great because I was wondering like, where do they go with this? Cause there's a yeah. whole storyline here that is, I'm not sure how appropriate it is. I don't know what the vibe here, but I'm glad they went for it and they did it. And it's like, it's like, yeah, okay. All right. This is the game we're playing. So I love that. But yeah, seven as a concept is so intriguing that even at the end, when it all, when it, the last hour of that game is some of the trippiest stuff you will see. I was just like, what? Yeah. Even as a kid, totally confused, but just accepted what was going on. Mm-hmm. So we we turned a remake um, after you know you mentioned it earlier the uh, Advent Children Dirge of Cerberus Crisis Core before Crisis I, all of the the spinoffs um, and sequels and prequels and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. After we get through all of that, we have this PS uh, I guess three tech demo um, of what a Final Fantasy VII could look like with modern sort of graphics there's this hunger this desire for a remake in modern sensibilities and so finally they reveal in 2015 that we're going to get it it's going to be a remake and in the trailer it says that um what comes with the reunion at hand may bring joy it may bring um pain or or sadness <laughs> fear I think is what they say, but whatever it brings, they are coming back. And then we get remake and it's not exactly the one-to-one -one sort of remake. So I mention it this way because you put out a video called, um, I, I love the unsolved mysteries aesthetic to it. When you played remake, the mysteries that are arrived um, a, a, that you were faced with, they're different from the original game. How sure. did you reckon with this new remake project versus what you kind of thought it might be going into it? I so loved it. I uh, have a lot of people in my life, a lot of friends who were not a fan because it was different. Okay. And I love that it's different. I love that they threw in a mystery because in remake, we 
don't particularly know much mm-hmm. until the very end when it starts to get a little off the wall. But for the most part, it's like, what are these weird spirit things showing up? What's this mm-hmm. about? It was totally different, and it made me intrigued. And I'm a sucker for a good mystery. So having that injected into a game I already knew, to me, seemed like, of course, this is the natural progression of this. They can't just re-release a game. It doesn't make any sense to do that. The game already exists. I've always, you know, I've always been a fan of fun remakes. Like a great example is um, they re-released, uh, remade Dead Space. Yeah, and Dead Space is one of my favorite games of all time. I love that game. Mm-hmm. But even in that, they changed some things. They added some things. They tweaked some things. Mm-hmm. And I appreciated that because as someone who played the original, it didn't take away from the game. It made it better. This, I think is designed differently in that it is for people who played the original. Mm-hmm. And even though they're like, you don't need to have played the original. As someone who has, I appreciate it so, so much mm-hmm. more because mm-hmm. having gone through it and experienced it, seeing the changes and, and knowing like, wait, that's wrong. That's not how that happens. Yeah. Or this is the thing. And then to see them acknowledge why it's wrong, that's like, yeah, you're right. That does seem weird, doesn't it? And you're like, yeah, that does, devs. What are you doing? They're like, we'll never tell. And to watch them do that is so much fun. And so I was super invested. And the entire time while playing through it, I was like, oh, my God, what are we what are we doing? And for the longest time, I was like, guys, are those spirit things supposed to be the fans? And <laughs> they, want, they want the story to be what it originally was. But... Uh, and that's why they keep trying to change it back. But our characters in the game are trying to do something different. But those ghost things, they don't want. And I, I was even in that headspace where I was like, we're fourth wall breaking. This is going to be crazy. Yeah. Obviously, that's not the way we went. But that's where I was <laughs> at the time. And I'm totally down for stuff like that. I love a good uh, fourth wall break. I love something that the game is like, hey, player, we're going to mess you up right now. Big fan of that. So the fact that they were doing that in a game that I thought I knew Made me so happy. I love the fact that they're like, we're going to get real weird with it. So I enjoyed every minute of it. Do you feel like the game was multifaceted enough that even if you really love something specific about the first one, you could find something in it that you liked, whether it's revamped combat, whether it's an introduction of some uncertainty, the story changes a little bit. Why do you think having something that is multifaceted like that helped it maybe connect with a bit of a broader audience than just people who had played the first one. Well, it's, it's more than nostalgia bait, right? Like they didn't just say, we're going to make a thing that you love again. They went in and they really captured um, not only the essence of the characters, but of the world. And Mm. they then took that and made it bigger. I think the idea that, that Midgar is a full game a 40, 50, 60, 80 hour game, however long you're playing. And it's just one part of it really goes to show exactly what they were going for. We're going to take something that was a small part and really expand on it and give you more lore and more story. We're going to give you time with Jesse Biggs and Wedge. We're going to give you time to go explore and meet new characters and see new things. And we're also going to include a sort of more updated, fun version of combat, but it still feels like where you were. And again, going back to the characters, we're going to give you an updated, better version of all the main characters, but like it still feels like what you experienced. The characters are still emotionally the same. And so having all of that in there, I think really added to not just um, why new people would fall in love with it, but also why fans of the original would be like, ah, this is what I want. Cause I've always, I've always thought that the best retro games are games that, feel retro but Hmm. aren't right Hmm. like a real retro game you would be like wow this feels old no a a retro style game and so they took that attitude and put it in this it's not retro by any means but it's the attitude of it makes you feel like what it was but entirely different and that's a very fine space to walk it's why i like that one so much it's also why i am really curious where they end up going because i have um to me, this franchise feels a lot like the Matrix trilogy mm. and that when I finished the second Matrix movie, Reloaded, my friends and I had so many theories. We were so convinced of what we were like, dude, there mm. was like there, the outside world wasn't destroyed. Dude, it's all a lie. Or or it's a Matrix and a Matrix. Like how on earth can Agent Smith be outside? It doesn't make any sense unless it's this. 
and then to see a third movie that we were like, nah, this ain't it. Nope. I'm terrified, but hopeful they'll nail this, but I'm terrified we may get a third game that's going to be not what I expect based on the mysteries they've created. And so that's the, the second game gives you like, we took the mysteries of the first one and we just cranked it up to 11, yeah. which is fine. I loved it. But now I'm like, can they deliver on a satisfying <laughs> conclusion to this? I don't know. We'll find out together, I guess. I'm going to have to find out from you later who the Merovingian of Rebirth is <laughs> going into it's the good, third one. You know, that's a fantastic question. I don't know. I, I mean, we'll find out next game when he shows up for like six minutes, double screen time, and then disappears. <laughs> and then yeah. it never mattered. We talked about never it for years, again. and it never yeah, yeah. mattered. That's it. I love it. Uh, yeah, we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> Well, you know, you said earlier that you do not like reviewing games or, or like, you know, having that whole deal. Yet you just said you really liked this game, okay, with Rebirth. So I would be really interested in, in kind of your classic review style format. What did you like about this game? I, th there's, um, th there's a lot to kind of dissect. What was it about the narrative? What was it about the experience as a whole? When you finish, when you wrapped credits or whatever, um, you think back on it and you're like, okay, what what was the essence of this game and how does that relate to the original? Sure. I think that gameplay-wise, uh, it was a phenomenal experience. The music is incredible. Mm -hmm. Graphically, beautiful. Zone-wise, the different things you do, amazing. The fact that they so effortlessly nailed Gold Saucer, love yeah, that. Real. Just uh, that wait. was very cool. Mini game um, stretch. Break. Having Sid come into it, right? Big fan. Expanding. Did you like the changes with Sid? Yeah, I was totally fine with that. I okay. also like the expanded nature of Red's storyline and yeah. what they did with that. Um, with all that said, uh, those mini games can kiss my butt. I oh. absolutely ninety percent <laughs> of those mini games I was like unnecessary. I get it, and there, some of them are fun, and some of them I was like, you mean I have to pick a mushroom a certain way, and if I don't pick it correctly, I just lose? <laughs> and there's no, I can't do it over, I just lose? It's Throw called replayability. <laughs> oh, I will never replay that again. I did it, and I was like, I'm done. I'm never doing that part. I will That's ignore me that with mini quest. Gears and Gadgets. Gears and Gadgets was my, like, bane of existence. Yeah, right. oh. Anytime they were like, hey, Tifa, do a pull-up or sit-up contest against someone who's just going to cheat, I was like, I hate this, <laughs> and I will find the dev who made this, and we're going to straight fight. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, that was not cool with me. With that said, um, ignoring all of the minigames, the story was great. The expanded, again, adding the, the Yuffie plot line, which was right. definitely not a thing in the original, having that be in there. Uh, was amazing, giving Rufus more to do. Uh, with that said, there was a one plot line that I was like, oh, this is for people who played the mobile game. The addition of like the Wu-Tai story. Yeah, where Glenn. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, no, that's something that I did not do. And it felt very Kingdom Hearts, where it's like, well, yeah. if you played all eight mobile games, I'm like, I did not. I don't know who this person is. And it does not affect me at all. But it didn't let me, you know, it didn't bother me. And then in the end, it turned out to really be a whole nothing burger anyway. So I was like, all right. But um, that whole chance they took with trying to make it uh, I don't want to say metaphysical but definitely like there was some some stuff going on where at a certain point when I realized stamp was different frequently yeah, I like my mind was going a mile a minute and I was like what is happening that is not the same dog that we just saw what is going and so once I was in that space it didn't matter this story could have been the goofiest, stupidest thing ever. And I would have been like, what does that mean? How does this work? They got me. Right. So I was completely hooked. And not just seeing what they were going to do. Because, again, in the original, you're in Midgar. And it seems very, like, you could do that in a modern tale. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of jumping into an open world in Final Fantasy VII. And then, like, how on earth are they going to do that in a modern way that doesn't look like just a guy walking on a giant map? I was so intrigued. And the fact that I explored every inch of that, probably places Damn, I shouldn't yeah. have explored. I spent so much time just walking around, looking at stuff, doing all the different things. The fact that they created a card game that is <laughs> has a mystery and like a threat and a weird like static fourth wall breaking. I was like, what are we doing? What's so that? all of that absolutely had me. And it was one of those things where I just needed to see where it was going. And it... 
even the ending as it is is kind of a mystery. And even then, I was like, mm -hmm. "All right, all right, I'm in. Let's see, let's see what you do with. Let's see what you do with this." Yeah, it's it's a fantastic example of just letting a dev team run wild, mm -hmm. and they definitely did. This is this is out there in many ways. Like the the jump yeah. from remake, which is like there's little ghost things, and what are they about, to rebirth, which is like we're getting all timey wimey, is. Mm -hmm. Incredible, and I'm totally here for it. They really just said, screw your expectations. We're going to make something insane, and I am absolutely a fan of that. So did you even bother trying to make sense of it? What do you think is going on with all of these worlds, the chihuahuas, the, the dogs, sure, sure. all of the things? So do think? I don't know if you've had this conversation before, but this is absolutely my theory. I think it is, it is completely sound. So okay. the devs have said that the movie Final Fantasy VII Advent Children is uh, canonical. It is still a thing that happens, mm -hmm. and it will happen. And so from that point, I'm like, okay, here's what I know about that movie. Uh, in that film, Sephiroth, the villain, is still existing in the live stream. Mm. And in that film, he creates three, uh, I don't know, like reflections of himself yeah. to exist in the real world, and each of them represents a part of him. And then at the end, like one combines with Genova to become like a body for Sephiroth and there's like a fight. It's pretty cool. But that's kind of the basis of where I'm at. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, if the villain still exists in the live stream, which is again, the live stream is the blood of the planet. It is um, something they've established as being like, when you die, you go to the live stream. When things mm -hmm. are born, they come from the live stream. The live stream is everything. And the, the the Shinra as a company is like sucking that dry, which is killing the planet, but also like messing with the flow of existing life, be it yeah. people or animals or whatever. And so if Sephiroth is just chilling in there, um, then there's a lot of questions, which I think the game tries to answer as to why that would be and how you could do that. But my assumption then is the scenes where Aerith shows up and is like, hey, Cloud, good job, buddy probably means she is in there as well. So my mm -hmm. basic starting point is that even though there is a conflict happening in the world we recognize as real, in the live stream, which is a place that I I have to believe is something that is past, present, future, there is no time. It's sort of yeah. uh, this place where existence isn't how we see it. Um, my thought then is if there's two people in there, one, polar opposites. One is sort of like the last living representation of these people who took care of the planet. And one is the last living representation of this like outside force that is trying to destroy the planet. And they are butting heads mm. sort of, if it's in the life force, it's in perpetuity. They're doing it forever. It's a perpetual battle that is always happening. And so I think the premise of this is that the two characters and I'm not sure who started what, but the idea that the two of them are waging this war, um, not just in the live stream, but through space and time. Because the live stream is its mm. own thing that Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth are happening in different timelines across different universes, question mark, that it, or, or reflections of themselves. And all of these versions, like there is, I'm convinced that when Cloud walks around, it goes, and there's a static thing. I'm convinced that is different reflections of Cloud across mm. different things. I don't think it's a Sephiroth, like he's remembering the past. I think it's genuinely just like, we are seeing the same story play out through different uh, versions of itself. And the okay. two characters, Sephiroth and, and Aerith, are trying to... Uh, one of them's trying to win, but it's kind of like the us viewing what Doctor Strange would have seen in the in uh, yeah. Marvel when he's like, "There's only one out of 14 million. There's only one winning." That's what they're trying to achieve. Mm. Each of them is trying to find the one where they win, and so they're playing out multiple versions of it over and over and over again. Uh, but they're all happening at the exact same time, so yeah, they're true. all doing thousands and thousands of variations right. of the same story. And we are experiencing 
parts of each one, which is why sometimes there are different dogs in the background. Like the, the mm -hmm. stamp as a character is different. Sometimes Cloud is experiencing Aerith alive, but not really. And sometimes she is dead. And, some, and there's like different versions. And Sephiroth's game is I'm going to play all these people and mm -hmm. I'm going to like get in Cloud's head. And because there's questions they brought up where it's like, what is real? When we know if we've played, like we know, right? Like we know what happened. So right. why are they bringing this up in the game? And I think that's the villain trying to like change stuff. But at the same time, I think Aerith as a character is also using our heroes as chess pieces. Mm. So no matter what we think of the two of them, they're both sitting at a board playing chess with each other. And all the characters we're playing as are just pieces that are being moved and used. And so that's why um, it feels weird to us because certain things that are happening, you're like, why, why would we do that? Or what's the point mm -hmm. of this? Or what is that? And it's because there's this grand game being played between the two last representatives of like these two factions that have been since the dawn of time fighting over the world. Um, and this is this, their sort of like last gambit thing where they're just mm. constantly creating but it isn't one after the other it's yeah. all layered on top of each other and i feel like potentially that changes the way you should look at the first game because it is remake but more importantly the first final fantasy i think we probably can say okay that's the first version of this mm. and then everything that happens afterwards is the fallout of that so it doesn't like negate it okay. otherwise then what is real? Like you can't say the first game didn't happen and it's one of right. the many layers. Otherwise it doesn't, it just adds too much complication. And I don't want to go that far to be like, no, no, it's what is, what is reality at that point? <laughs> why bother? Right? So I feel like the first game was its own thing. And at the end, when we get the ending, we get, it's not necessarily a happy ending at mm -hmm. the end of final fantasy seven. When that game ends, it goes 500 years later and everyone's gone. The yeah, only people yeah. left. Allegedly. Are, yeah. Well, okay. it's been said by the dev team, no, they're they're dead. Everyone's okay. Gone. And so that brings up the question is, oh, so then what the hell's Advent Children? Like yeah. it's still, they win, but still lose. It's this mm -hmm. thing where it's it's sad, but the earth recovers. Like one of the things like yeah. humanity's gone, but the earth or the planet still lives. And I feel like that's one of those endings where it's like, no, that was one of the bad, like that was the bad outcome. And, and earth doesn't want that. So we got to do a whole thing. And so that's why we're just layering and layering. I don't know. It's a lot of thought going into this, but a also it can be yeah. total nonsense, you know? I, I think, Wade, I think maybe it's time for a good old fashioned summary game like we played with <laughs> Clark. I have taken notes. That's oh fair. Boy. And maybe we'll just, I'll give you a second to think about yeah. maybe where you want to start in all of this. And, uh, <laughs> Um, that's fair. Ladies and gentlemen, I had that all bottled up and I just needed to get it out. It was no, so that's sorry. Oh, like, yeah, we didn't even this. clap. We got a applause. That, no, was, that amazing. was so good. It was so Truly, good. It, and the encapsulation of all of those things, like it, I, I was taking a mental note, Evan, it's like, okay, there's some things that we really do kind of need to explain here uh, and stuff. So, Evan, as somebody that's probably not as deep into all of this stuff as, Certainly as like not. Jesse and I, <laughs> right? Um, where, where can we uh, help you out? Let okay. me help. Let me talk at you. Yeah. I okay. Got I got it. Uh -oh. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time <laughs> for story time. This story is a journey into Jesse's mind. <laughs> As he experiences the world of Final Fantasy. <laughs> uh -oh. mm -hmm. So you can just, uh, I'll go point by point. Um, sure. It is going to be a gross oversimplification of, Absolutely. The, of the beautiful mural that you just painted. And you can say yes, you can say no, or you can feel free to modify my interpretation of your... Oh, I will. Don't you yeah. worry. Okay, great. Good, 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 good. <clears throat> As we start our journey, you said that... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, go on. <clears throat> Once upon a time, the devs said that Advent Children is still <laughs> canon. <laughs> so once upon a time, the devs said that Advent Children is still canon. Therefore, in, in your opinion, that means that the story is somewhat anchored in having to conform to the what happens in Advent right. Children. So you're saying that that means that it is almost objective fact that Sephiroth still exists in the live stream in three parts and that 
those events still take place. So Sephiroth still exists in the live stream in three parts because but they have said clarity, oh, clarity, really quickly. Sephiroth exists in the live stream as a whole, mm -hmm. but in Advent Children, he creates three characters. Hey, there we go. Each represents a different part of himself, yep. and then he's using them in Advent Children as an example. They come off as kind of children. Uh, they don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. Right. They just do it because it's what they're designed to do. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not a big fan of Advent Children. Like, Advent Children looks cool. It has a lot of cool fights. But, like, story-wise, it's kind of all over the place. But that's yep. one thing that for sure we know is that they are designed to find the the remains of Genova for Sephiroth, who is in the live stream, who has been defeated there uh, in Final Fantasy VII. Yes. Um, one one um, question for you, Jesse. The, the devs have said that Advent Children is canon, and it's going to be linked up with this re-trilogy. Um, are you of the mindset that if... <laughs> this is such a wild way of asking it, but if time is linear, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sure. does the remake trilogy happen after Advent Children? Meaning, is this re-trilogy akin to a sequel, or is this a reimagining of the original without negating the original just as a different world? What would you say? I think that goes to the definition of linked up. Like I, They basically mm -hmm. say that. They don't say... This happens afterwards. Right. They just say they're connected. They say it links and so, up. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like that's the key in that it is the grounding fundamental of what this game is rather than this will lead to that. Mm -hmm. In my mind, um, the best way to think about it is if there are, uh, like if you start movie one, mm -hmm. watch it all the way through, and then rewind it, like anyone rewinds anything, rewind it and then play four other movies or however many at the same time, you have already experienced movie one, but movie mm. one is still playing at the same time as the other movies now. And okay. I think that's what's happening is Final Fantasy VII, the original, it happened, but everything now is happening like after the fact, happening layered on top of each other. Mm. So... It's that so Advent Children exists, Final Fantasy into Dirge of Cerberus, into Advent, like all those things exist, Crisis Core, whatever, they all exist. But now a bunch of other versions are being layered on top of them. And the question is, how many and how long they've been going on, and uh, all of that. And also the question of how long does it go back? Like, is there yeah. a start point, or is it throughout all time and history? Right. They just keep layer. And so that's the, a lot of questions. Not a lot of answers, just like quantum mechanics, but it's Crazy. one of those things where I feel like that is the anchor in saying these characters, even though they died in the game, exist in the live stream. And because they're special or because they refuse to like mm -hmm. rejoin with the live stream, they exist separately of it. And so they exist with outside, outside of time and space. So they're kind of like gods looking down on reality and altering it as they see fit to win is kind of the, the vibe I'm getting from this. And so while we are playing through seven, the original, it is again, movie one. And mm -hmm. then that ends, but everything kind of rewinds outside of space and time. So now there's layers on top of it. So seven still exists and it will play out the same way, mm -hmm. but there's other versions of it happening and they're all trying to find the version where they win. Hmm. And Okay. If that happens, I don't know what occurs. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what that means, yeah. but they're all trying to win in the end is kind of the vibe I'm going for. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Evan, what other bullet points do you have there? Well, you just kind of reviewed the next one, which was great. Uh, the fact that uh, Aerith is probably still in the live stream uh, and that the way that time passes or doesn't, maybe there is no time in the live stream impacts how she is able to interact with the world and how we see her do that in the game. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's absolutely correct. It, it, there's a lot of questions about the live stream I simply have no answers to. For example, what the purpose of sort of the Zack storyline is. Mm. Um, is he there to atone for something? Is that how the live stream sort of prepares you to rejoin it? Uh, he has a whole story. And the question is then why do other characters show up in that? Is mm. it because of memories you created? But like... Why do characters he never met show up in that? There's a lot of questions that just aren't answered. Um, but maybe it's not about him. Maybe it's the idea that this is uh, 
people Aerith have put there for him to then assist with him going to the point where he helps Cloud uh, during the fight at the end. Um, who knows? Like, we just don't have the answers to any of that. And again, quantum mechanics, baby. Like, there's some things you just never will know the answer to and you just need to accept it. Yeah. And so I feel like maybe that's kind of the space where there's just a lot happening and we may get answers. We may not. And so that's, you know, that's where I'm at with the live stream. It's, it's a mess. But maybe we're not designed to understand it. Maybe that's the point. We're at this really fun point in a trilogy where the second movie has the most freedom to do the most interesting things. Right. right. Um, and so it's really fun to get to have these conversations right now. And I like the way, personally, that they divided the games up into three uh, in, in this way. And so, you know, it's, it's nervous because you back don't know to the what's going to be resolved. Yeah. yeah. Back to the Matrix, it's the same idea where it's they threw out all these ideas. Like the first movie right. set the groundwork. The second movie, they were like, it's going to get weird. We're going to throw some things out there and we're going to have like some really cool moments. And then somehow a character is going to exist in reality. And so it makes you think like, well, what is real and how does this work? And what is the foundations of like, is any of this real? Is it a computer thing within a computer thing in a matrix and a matrix? Mm -hmm. And then the sad part is, is they have to decide on things and be like, this is the ending. Yeah. And if it's not what you're expecting, it's a huge letdown, which again is where I'm at. And so I think by saying, look, there's some things I'll just never understand. I'm bracing myself for maybe it not being what I want at all. Right. And just yeah. the devs are going to create an ending and we just have to accept that's the ending that they created. But who knows, right? If, if, the less pressure I put on myself to nail it, the mm. more I'm like, it's fine if it isn't what exactly what I wanted. Yeah, we're having a great time in the mystery of it. Right. right. Anything right. Uh, before I jump into the next point? Yeah, no, Jesse, I, I think you're spot on with this idea of the live stream. While there's a lot of murkiness um, to the understanding of the live stream generally, um, we, we can discern that the live stream has... Um, some sense of being omnitemporal, right? It is past, present, sure. and future, and people can exist in there, or at least the the um, their consciousness, or at least their um, essence can exist in there, a memory of them, um, and can actually exist in past, present, and future. And the reason that, that I think is important is you've said a couple of times, and so for our listeners and for Evan, um, who may not fully understand all of this stuff, um, it, Sephiroth, five years prior to the the present in the game, falls into the live stream. And this is where he acquires the knowledge of the ancients, the memories of the planet, and really finds the secrets of the live stream. Aerith, presumably in her death, goes into the live stream at that point, at least in the present temporality sort of thing. And what that means is that they can, in ways, if they are conscious of the flow of time, Linear, linearly, they can navigate this live stream to affect past, present, and future. And so I, I just kind of wanted to say that in that way, Evan, because there's a lot of transcending um, just the, the temporal nature of, of linear time there. So again, not to get too heady with that, but it's impossible and that, to. <laughs> that brings up the fact that in the live stream, what is real, what is not is a big right. issue mm. because if it's everything, it can also be nothing. Which again, it's starting to get out there that the right. idea that that yeah they can be everywhere and do anything, but also if it is everywhere and doing anything, it is also not there. <laughs> so it's there's a there's a lot to think about when it comes to that because it's so metaphysical what it is, and it was so much more simpler in the original. It was like that is the blood of the planet, sure. And when you right. die, you return to it, and new things. Now it's a whole other thing where it's beyond space and time because. Right. It isn't blood and it isn't oil that is being sucked up. Like right. there's a different message because very clear in the original, it's like they're killing the planet by draining the oil of the planet. And this is a different experience entirely where there's something else mm. happening and they're, they're getting a little more out there with what it actually is. And um, we'll see well, where yeah. it goes. And I, I think that that's such a really interesting way of leaning into this with this remake trilogy is because that makes Shinra all the worse, right? This isn't right. just oil or fossil fuels that they're consuming. This is like lives. This is the essence of life on the planet. And when you suck that up, life dies. Like the planet um, is is broken um, fundamentally at that point. Um, somebody in 
my YouTube comments a couple of weeks ago made a really interesting observation that I keep thinking about. And they said in the original game, the focus was on how Genova was manipulating memories of specific characters and breaking down the mindset of Cloud. But what if Genova's infection of kind of the, the psyche isn't just for Cloud, but it's the planet as a whole. Therefore, it's subverting the memory of the planet. Therefore, to your question and to the, the trailer's question, what is fact and what is fiction? Even history and present and future, all of that's called into question because the planet is being subverted by Genova. And for those that, that may not remember this moment in chapter one of Rebirth, Sephiroth himself, himself says that Genova can um, become the things that we hate, uh, and also in chapter five, become the things that we hate and, and take the form of things to kind of mess with our psyche. And this creates a rift between um, Cloud and Tifa, for example, early on. And so I, I, I would be curious, what do you think of that sort of interpretation? How much you reckon with that? Is this a Genova sort of thing with the whispers and the canon flow of things being disseminated at the end of Remake? Sure. What, what do you do with that? Yep. I think it's, it's probably accurate to the point that in um, Advent Children, the whole thing that's happening is the geostigma, which is yeah. all the people, especially children, just slowly being messed up by the after effects of Genova. So it's very obvious that Genova is still a thing. Yeah. And at least from my interpretation from the original, and at least what I think is going on in this, even though Sephiroth's the big bad, Genova's the one controlling him. Right. And so he does everything he does because not just that he's like, all my cells are Genova. Like I was, but because Genova is a corrupting influence, that's the whole point is it's this yes. force from outside the galaxy that uh, Genova's whole thing is just goes from planet to planet to planet, killing the planet and then ejecting itself back out into space and doing it all over again. Like that's the vibe of what Genova does. Yeah. And so I think um, having it be sort of more of a, instead of a uh, like virusy thing, more cosmic horror, mm. I think, is Ooh, what they're going oh, yeah. for. And having it not just, it comes and kills, but really it is messing with people. And because originally it was the cells in Sephiroth were Genova. And because mm -hmm. Cloud had Sephiroth cells, he was linked to that. And so there was like a Genova vibe. But now it's, no, this is, this thing is in the planet infecting it, not just what we uh, see for our two main characters, but also what we see in just existence. It is in the live stream. It is changing time and space. A lot of the fights with Genova in Rebirth and Remake, it just appears. And it's like, hey, I'm here now, and I'm going to fight mm -hmm. you. And it's like, where'd that come from? How's that there? What's the point of that? Um, it takes over some of the uh, various, like, wandering zombie corpses of people who were once soldiers who have been infected mm -hmm. and are slowly turning. And that's the same thing that we get a little bit of that, like, What's going to happen to Cloud? What's the vibe there? Is right. Cloud also turning? What's And that's been a big thing since the original, is that there's this slow morphing of Cloud, and we start losing him, and we see that here, yeah. that something is clearly off. But then we have the idea of the uh, sort of white holy materia, and that's a whole other thing that now exists. Plus, now there's another materia that's just, like, empty, blank, mm -hmm. transparent, I have no idea what that's for. I don't know what's in. They've included all these other things. So for every question they ask and for every mystery they give, they also just throw in a MacGuffin that could be the thing that <laughs> solves it. And I, I'm here for that. The question is, how do we all put it together in a way that that's makes fair. sense to a player? Because I feel like at the end, you just want to have an answer that you're like satisfied with mm. and makes sense to you. Even if it doesn't answer everything, having, say, for example, a... a, a in my mind, it's very obvious that you have a black and white materia that were the things that existed in the original and mm. they, they can save the universe or not, whatever. But then you have this third one now, which I think is the whole point of including it, which is it's about to get spicy. What is this? How does it work? What's the point of this? Yeah. And it could be anything from a complete game changer to just that's the thing that gives Cloud control over himself again. Mm. So it could be anything. Who knows? But they included it because like... Now we're going to give you something else to work with. We're going to mess with this. But again, it comes down to timelines. And one, it has been used, and so it's just an empty thing. And one, it hasn't. 
because Aerith is, is dead. And then one, it, it, there's so many different ways to look at this now because there's so many mm. layers that it can be very confusing. And I think that's kind of the point. Sure. sure. Devin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are my your thoughts on that? I, I just, I just know that you have like a, a list of things over there, and I want to, I want to honor that. So, uh, uh, okay, so here's this uh, potential thing that we've identified is the uh, truly maybe the most altering thing for the story of the game, or it could be an entirely just device to get one other thing to happen. It could be a full MacGuffin, and and sure. we have no idea what it is, and it's it's one of the biggest mysteries at the end of this game, Evan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so i think um excellent summary <laughs> uh i think i'm curious uh about uh, framing that within the context of Aerith and sephiroth in this struggle in the life stream back and forth and that being the dynamic right this idea of um as you said it here back to story time sorry um that there's it's a perpetual battle between two combatants one uh, being stewards of the planet and one being foreign, that cosmic horror that you referenced. Um, mm -hmm. And that a lot of the things that we can't explain or some of the mystery is connected to a cosmic battle in the live stream that is transcending these events or timelines, be they parallel or converging at times. I wonder, Wade, if that would be a good place to kind of start picking some of this apart a little bit and kind of set that up. Uh, framing conversation yeah this is this kind of conversation is where um rebirth and remake get a lot of critiques regarding its kingdom hearts nature because actually in kingdom hearts 3 there is a chess game literal chess between scene. Yeah, yeah, literal yeah. Chess scene. so when you you when you say that i'm immediately saying oh gosh this is very much like that and it but it does feel like that is the case, especially with the climactic moment in rebirth where you have Aerith stepping out to face sephiroth um, uh, alongside Cloud, even after her, quote, death, question right. mark. Will you explain that, that a little stuff. bit more for people who may not know what you're referencing? I say again, I'm sorry. Will you just explain the significance of her stepping out over Cloud? And yeah, why yeah, yeah. So in the climactic battle, um, after her alleged death scene, um, Cloud is in this kind of world between worlds, is what I will call it, um, where he's facing off against Sephiroth. And then there's a portal, almost Avengers Endgame style, where Aerith steps out, and it's the two of them against Sephiroth in this battle. And so it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you dead? Are you alive? Either way, we're going to fight Sephiroth together. Yeah. At the same time, though, in this climactic ending, yeah. Jack, a character who yes. Cloud lost, shows up as well. And yes. he helps Cloud during this fight. But he is also very dead. And we get... Question a mark? <laughs> yeah, we get a plot line through this game where Zack, a character who has died prior to the Final Fantasy VII story starting, has returned and we see him go back to a version of Midgard where our main characters, for the most part, are dead. And so he is going through an experience, but the question is, what reality is that? Because in right. Zack's storyline of this game, our characters died at the end of Remake during the big uh, sort of tornado crazy scene, and their bodies are recovered by Shinra. Except in that space, Cloud and Aerith exist, but are mm -hmm. unconscious, which means that in my mind, and this is the thing that I thought about the entire time, because I even said while I was playing uh, on stream, I was like, they're going to do a thing. The minute they introduced the unconscious bodies of mm. Cloud and Aerith, I can't remember if Aerith unconscious, but I feel like she was. She um, is, yeah. And, there, and I thought, oh, that is the way that through this story, they will keep moving back and forth between the realities mm -hmm. is there's only in, in, in this story, there is only one from this point on one consciousness of cloud. Yeah. He's going to move back and forth between all these different versions of himself. And that's, that's when I thought that the Zach storyline was real. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not even sure it's real. I'm right. thinking maybe it was just a version of him in the live stream, experiencing things to get him to the point he needed to be there to help cloud. To and and again, it's an unanswered question. It's very uh, sort of intentionally convoluted to be a mystery. Mm -hmm. But the, I was like, oh, so Aerith is in Cloud are going to move back and forth between realities, and this is all part of her 
uh, game to win. And the best way to describe this is even though chess is accurate, there was a subreddit that I do not remember the exact name of it. I wish I did. It's something chess. And the whole point is people put a chess board down and eventually it's like an arrow and a taco and uh, like a big foot. And they just keep adding things. It's like just convoluted chess. Like, yeah. oh, well, this beats that. And this and that I think is what's happening here. Where it's, yeah, it's a chess board, but they're literally throwing anything they can at it to win. Mm. And in this case, Aerith was like, all right, if we're going to mess with time, I'm going to not only help from beyond the grave, but I'm going to send this other guy who was Cloud's mentor to help as well. And we're going to just do this whole thing. So even though at the end, Sephiroth clearly has the upper hand and has been planning and manipulating Cloud the entire time, Aerith shows up with a totally other character that we thought was dead and was like, nah, dude. Let's... And so again, they butt heads and there really is no winner. And it's like, see you in the third one. And that's, mm -hmm. again, the, the vibe of the entire rebirth as a story is just they are constantly battling and everything they do is like this person will do one attack and this person will do another and they're just taking piece for piece for piece and then at the end they're kind of like stalemate all right let's try this again the implication though of course is that Sephiroth's like you fool I have been planning way ahead and Eric's like no I have been planning way ahead <laughs> and it comes down to this thing that even at the end yeah all the other characters are totally sad and depressed mm -hmm. uh tifa is a complete mess at the end of this and i don't know that she knows who to trust and mm -hmm. i think she's really pissed off at cloud meanwhile cloud as a character is like i saw Aerith as a real part like i'm not even sure Aerith is dead and mm -hmm. he's going through a whole thing and again i don't know if this is something that we can say cloud or sorry Aerith and sephiroth i feel like are operating so outside a time and space mm -hmm. that even though I want to give them like Aerith did this thing because it's good or whatever, I'm not even sure that's the case. Right? I feel mm -hmm. like she may be so concerned with winning this thing to save the planet that these people who she knows and loves may be pieces in the process to get it done rather than characters that she cares about oh. because she's outside of space and time. It could get real weird. You know what I mean? Like, being, it's very much like a, a Dr. Manhattan kind of vibe. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I can love people, but after a while, I'm so disconnected from reality that, like, do I anymore? Or is this about something bigger? You're the first when one that's comes... referenced Watchmen so far. Oh, that's true. I, but it's a, it's a pretty apt comparison, I would say. Um, when you get somebody that is so beyond the... the um, I guess the connection to reality, to the present, to time, um, in view of, quote, eternity or live stream mindset, then you do lose a little bit of grip. Um, and you see life as not life, death, but also the sense of rebirth. And there's this existence beyond. And I think that there is, uh, there's a lot of that in the first game in Remake, right? Mm -hmm. Where Aerith is like, you know, the plate's going to fall. I mean, you, she doesn't say this, but it's very much like, what will be, will be, you know? Right. Right. And it, it is this, um, I, I call it a Calvinistic trust in what is planned, right? It's predestination. And then at the end of Remake, you have the complete subversion of that, where the whispers, you know, you defeat the whispers. And I have a question on that. At the end of Remake, what do you think happens does Sephiroth goad the party into defeating the Whispers? Or did the Whispers need to be defeated? Were they infected? What do you make of that? I think, sadly, any interpretation I had is changed because of Rebirth and the fact that there mm. are now white Whispers. Yes, sure. Or gray or whatever color they were. There's two different types. And so in right. my assumption is that perhaps those, at one point in time, this was sort of the way of time correcting itself. Mm -hmm. But then Sephiroth at the end has taken oh, like taken over that portion. Okay. And so the white ones are Aerith trying to reassert herself into whatever the hell these things are, sure. be it sort of arbiters of fate or whatever. Like he has clearly controlled them by the end. He becomes yeah. like made of them and becomes a giant monster. So it's very obvious that he controls them in some way. But for the most part, Throughout most of the story, they're kind of just like, no, this is the way it's got to be. You can't. A great example is when Reno shows up to fight and Cloud's just going to kill him. And they're mm -hmm. like, no, dude, that no, doesn't no, happen no. in the original. So they pull him away. And maybe that's one of the very first signs that we're seeing that uh, perhaps there is a version where the live stream does not like 
people messing with it. Mm -hmm. And so Sephiroth and Aerith are both unnatural in it. And so these things are trying to correct, uh, correct what should have been a natural progress of what did happen. Mm. But because the layers start building, you know, towards the end of like, as you go through remake, like I was saying, those static flashes happen more and more and more and more. And yeah. again, I totally convinced that isn't like Sephiroth's method cloud. I think that's straight up just a different, we're huh. seeing a different reality every time. Mm -hmm. And the reason I firmly believe that is when that starts happening towards the end of Rebirth, the dog in the background stamp is different. Yeah. With each each time there's a there's a different dog that we see, and I was like, oh, what? So I think that means that we're seeing multiple timelines, and it's only towards the end of Rebirth that it really starts to overlap, and we see how truly many there really are. Oh yeah. The devs have said that the the Zach interlude episodes um, and, and some of this stuff with Stamp and all of that, it's a way of explaining and expanding the lore of the live stream. So what what can you deduce about the live stream based on this? Do you have I, any I idea about that? At the end, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Zach, when he helps, he's like, hey, dude, thanks. And he like sort of fades away. I'm pretty sure that's what happens to him I he think. says um save her um that's like one of the last things that he says and then he says um uh see ya <laughs> then he, yeah, but he's, but he, but he, like, yeah he gets like a like i'm going now like he is <laughs> my people vibe. need me yeah he just sort of i wonder <laughs> if the so when tifa's in the live stream she experiences her past and moments yeah. of, of her past and i wonder if because she fell into it she's experiencing it differently but mm. if you die, for example, when you go there, the experience is one of, uh, again, I don't know if, if atonement's the right word, but it's sort of like mm. you get hit with a little bit of purgatory first before yeah, you can yeah. achieve some sort of like, I'm returning to the live stream. Or maybe you have to be willing to, mm. and then something happens there. But it, it, what it sets up to us is that it isn't just you die and then become green goop. Like yeah. there's a process by which you re-ingratiate yourself into the live stream and um, in Zach's case, his was, it's it's kind of like if you, it, the movie trope of like when someone dies and then you see like their spirit wake up and they look at their body and like, mm -hmm. whoa, what's that about? I think Zach dies during the scene right before the game starts and we get the sort of, the end scene of Crisis Core mm -hmm. and we get to see him sort of go out. But then in that, in his mind, or at least he lives. The question would be then if he turned around, would he still see his body there? But mm. the idea is he walked away from that and then he experiences a whole story and journey, mm. but it's really him being led, um, I think by Aerith to go help cloud. It also could just be the live stream did it, or he wanted it to happen again. Not really sure on the fine points there, but yeah. it is clearly something has occurred within the live stream for him to guide him to help with cloud. And again, it could be that, yeah, there's Aerith and Sephiroth fighting, but it could be the live stream is a whole third entity mm. that's like, mm. how about you both get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hey, middle Western person going, well, time to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really interesting piece. You know, you mentioned earlier that Sephiroth is being manipulated by Genova. And um, Sephiroth has said several times um, that the reunion is the merging of worlds. This is the reunion of worlds. And so we get all of these different worlds from Sam. Why do you think that Sephiroth wants to merge all of these? And what does that even mean to merge them into one? I think that's referring to the timelines, the multiple timelines happening, mm -hmm. that by making them one, there can literally be only one ending. And his plan okay. is to just collide them all together. And it may just be either pure chaos, which at that point he still wins, or yeah. it could be that the end game is I have a plan that's going to take us to a conclusion, which would be the next game where all these timelines come together. And I mean, that could, we could get a full on eight clouds, 20 clouds at one. Yeah. It could be crazy. Um, but the idea that he is trying to, at least the case, if, if he's controlled by Genova, which I, I'm pretty sure that's the whole point of, him as a character is that we see in Final Fantasy VII the original that the cloud that the Sephiroth we've been fighting most of the game is like not even the real dude. That guy is right. frozen up in a thing. Um, the Do idea you that seen the real dude yet? In no, um, I because every time that we fight him or see him, he's one of the many soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's just still in the live stream doing okay. his thing. Um, 
The question will be how do they interpret that for what happens towards the end of Final Fantasy VII, where we discover kind of like half of him or whatever he's yeah. doing. Um, I'm very curious what they do with that and how they explain mm. that story. But maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe that's the whole point. Is like from this point on, it's going to get totally different. It's going to be weird. Um, but the idea that if he's controlled by Genova and Genova's plan is like, look, I just suck up the life of worlds and that's my whole thing. Um, the Again, Cosmic Horror, we don't know why. We shouldn't really know why. It's mm -hmm. That's what it does. And it messes with people and controls people through its various cells. And then as you learn, Dirge of Cerberus, the whole plan is it's like, bye haters. And after destroys yeah. the world, leaves and goes to destroy other worlds. And that's all we really should know. Frankly, I'm totally fine with not knowing more about Genova. I think it's terrifying as a concept that this thing just like goes around killing worlds. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, various comic book characters or whatever. Like I go around, I eat a world and I'm Galactus. And it's like, but why? It's like, cause I'm hungry, dude. Like that's it. It's really all yeah. it needs to be. And so that's fine. Cause it adds that cosmic horror vibe to it. Like we don't understand it and it gets really weird. And now they're messing with time and space and what we see is reality. Mm. Very, uh, very cool stuff. I love that. But if deep down the idea is that if there's all these timelines, then it's sort of, there could still be one where it doesn't happen. And maybe as a cosmic entity, you, you can't just like, what do you do in one timeline? You win in one timeline, you lose. Like, yeah. It's too confusing for like, you can imagine something that's outside space and time being like, let's just keep it simple guys. You're getting too crazy. Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know what? Let me just eat this planet and move on. And so maybe that's not part of, like, you know, it, it could be one of those things where if the dominoes were, Aerith wins technically and saves the planet, even though humanity is mm. pretty much gone. If Aerith wins, then Genova loses. And Genova's like, nah, nah, nah. So I'm going to go back in the live stream and do another thing. And Aerith is like, nah, nah, nah. I'm going to make another timeline where this happens. Okay. And then it just keeps building and building and building. And so I would imagine that you have this sort of entity that's like, Mm. All right, we need to get them all back together. Like, this is too much. This is too confusing. We make them all together. And if they're all one and I win, then we're done. Mm. For those that are, are listening right now, and I'm watching, so sorry. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, your like, headache is, is appropriate. No, this is this is beautiful because, like, one of the big questions is why would you tell the story this way? You know, like the original game, not a lot of people, there were some plot gaps, plot holes, and it's like, where did Zach, who is Zach um, in the original game? There's like optional scenes that you totally miss out on if you don't go to certain places in the original sure. game. And so there was a way that they could have remade this game in a very straightforward fill in those plot holes sort of things. Why do you think they're telling the story this way? Uh... Besides creativity and wanting to do something new and fun and like mm -hmm. something they've done for years and years and years is, you know, just Square and now Square Enix is just a company always tries to get a little out there with their stories. I think it is a very smart way to get people to buy the next one. Mm -hmm. If you're going to make three games, you can't just say part one is Midgar. Boy, that was fun. And now we're, we're going to jump off this bridge and we're in the yeah. overworld. Okay, see you in the overworld. Like, if you know what's going to happen, if you weren't totally in to what was going on in the first one, there's no hook to keep you around for the second one. Yeah. Or uh, there's no reason to buy it immediately. Again, this can turn people off. They may not like the idea of including stuff in it. Right. But I think from a creative perspective, it allows you to do new and crazy things with something that is a property people already understand. It goes back to the idea of, like, you already have Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. It is a classic. You can buy it in many forms. So if we're going to make a remake, let's tell something different. Let's create a story that continues it, which is something they love to do. Final Fantasy VII might be the only Final Fantasy where they were like, let's make so much more of this and milk it dry. And they did. Mm. And this, I think, is another extension of that, which is, oh, it's Final Fantasy VII, but it's it's after Advent Children, but before Advent Children, but before... Fi like they created something that can both tell the story of Final Fantasy VII and mm. continue the story for longtime fans, which is a tough thing to do because, again, you want to cater to both of them. Yeah. I think this is the choice they made. And why do it? I don't know, because 
they like to get weird sometimes. Like sometimes that's really that simple. They just again, Kingdom Hearts is a perfect example. Hmm. They just like to get weird sometimes. Yeah, we just had BioRoxas, who's a Kingdom Hearts creator, on, and um, he he makes some great sense of all of that stuff. And I'm like, I um, I will call you when I go through that series next. I absolutely do not understand it. By the time I finish, I was fun. like, what did I just do? It's fun. The gameplay is amazing. I love yeah, it, it but it's just so much that unless you played everything, the the craziest thing was the jump from Kingdom Hearts one to two. Yeah. I remember playing two and being like, I've clearly missed something. And they're yeah. like, oh, you would have had to play the uh, there was... the, the like handheld version. Yeah. And this other. I was like, oh, well, okay. I'm very yeah. thankful they didn't do that with this. There's only one or two scenes where it's like, if you played these other games, you would need or to know this. Or read the book or, yeah, yeah all, right. all those kinds of things. But they've been very uh, smart in just kind of keeping it simple and making right. all of the confusing bits, things that you don't have to be pre- uh, sort of ingratiated with. You can just kind of figure it out as you go. Donald Duck is in this one. Donald Duck. <laughs> yeah. You love Why Donald does? Duck. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. Donald Duck fights like a thousand uh, Severoths. I've always said they were <laughs> fools for not having a three-way fight. The, if Disney is involved, they're fools. They should have had Severoth, Darth Vader, and like, I don't know, someone else in that fight. We can do Thanos now. There you go. Sephiroth, there. Thanos, Darth Vader versus Sora, Cloud, Luke. Like, and, and, and I don't know. Uh, let's, get like, uh, let's get like, let's get to, what's his face? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Iron Man. Throw him in there. Like, Iron Man. it would have been the craziest. They could, I would have played it just for that. Uh, the spectacle yeah. alone. It, it would have been terrible. I would have been like, what the hell is this? But no. oh my God, it would have been amazing. I, but, uh, you know. I would pay $1,000 to watch Goofy take a shield and slam it into Darth Vader and just go, gorge. That's all I can think about. It's like, gorge, Dorf. That's what I want. Gorge. <laughs> I think that's what the world wants. <laughs> right, yeah. That's, they should have done it. How do you want to wrap right up, there. Wade? How do you want to wrap the, up? Is to kind of close us out here, because we've hit so many things, and people's minds are, like, blown and melted and all that kind I'm of stuff. I'm so sorry. No, it's that's the great. beauty of it, right? Like, I'm but, worried about your this, time. <laughs> <laughs> this entire series is about trying to make sense of this game because there's so many different um, uh, opinions and thoughts out there. And like, that's, that's what we want to do. Try to platform people to give their, their interpretation. Um, I, I, I told Evan, this is, is like going back to my dissertation days, like um, trying to do a literature review. I'm just reviewing everybody's opinions out there. Right. Sure, sure. Um, and, and so trying to just make up my own mind on all this. Um, I want to tap into, as we wrap up, your history as a teacher, as an educator, as a um, as a um, observer of um, and uh, kind of curator of history for students and all this kind of stuff. Because when it comes to teaching history, we learn lessons from the past, right? And in this game. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, is it the same story? Is it a new story? Is it an add-on to the story? Are the themes the same as the original game? Or do you think that there are new uh, themes, lessons, and stories that the devs are telling through this one that they maybe didn't in the original game? I think it's a combination of both. I think okay. the story tells you what the original was. Mm -hmm. And the lessons that we learned from the original game, which again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, what they've done throughout all their games is try to give you something to think about. Mm. And the original gave you an entirely different set than what I think the remake and rebirth have done, which is, yeah, it's there. The original concepts are there and the ideas are there, but they've added layers to it now so that if you've already experienced that, there's something else to think about. And you know, there's the idea of parallel realities and quantum mechanics and timelines and what is real. That is a lot to think about. And it's something that I love thinking about mm -hmm. because there's no answer. Like I'm not going to know the answer to any of that ever. Yeah. And so I think that's something that is fun to delve into. And they have decided to do that. And whether it lands or not, uh, at least at this point, doesn't particularly matter because they're just trying to ask questions mm -hmm. and the next games where they have to actually come up with some answers and the answers may land they may not but it's the idea where we're at right now which is very compelling which is why i take it back yeah. to the matrix which is i had no idea where they were going with that and it was yeah. so open that 
you could sit around and talk like we're doing right now about all the theories they threw out, all the loose threads, all the things they put out there, and we'll see. We'll see if they learned a fundamental lesson. Like, if you ask these questions, you better give some answer rather than like, yeah. he was computer Jesus. Like, there has to be <laughs> a different yeah. answer. And we need something that is a little yeah. more, uh, I don't want to say grounded, but if you're going to present problems, give us some solution to the problems. Two final questions from me. Um, what is your biggest hope for part three? Uh, oh, I definitely, I think I just expressed it. The idea that we get something. Resolution. Even if it's, yeah, even if it's not an answer that I like, it's an answer that just doesn't, and you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't just create an ending because we need an ending. It gives us something that is an answer to not only what these characters are up to, but also respects them as characters, as people, mm. uh, and treats them like they're real people. And I think the benefit of a video game is you have the time to do it. You don't, you're not limited to two, three hours. Mm -hmm. You have the time to make it happen. So there's no excuse to just not do it. It's right there. You can make these characters have the conclusions they deserve, especially if this is like the last time, our last ride with them. Yeah. They deserve the best you can give. Wow. We would have also accepted more mini games. Yes. I know that that's. <laughs> no, I'm all right. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stories that we tell or at least the stories that are worth telling, teach us more about humanity, uh, our own existence, our own past experience. What is the message um, or the story that you take from this game? First off, I think that's an incredibly well put way to describe uh, kind of the attitudes of the time period we, we live in, mm -hmm. which is if you look back at the stories that were being told originally, there are stories that seem very obvious to us now, like having a story about, in Final Fantasy VI, dealing with depression and suicide and the end of the world and all these different things. Final Fantasy VII, dealing with sort of the idea of killing the planet you live on, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in Final Fantasy VIII, about the indoctrination of children and, and all these different things that go, like Final Fantasy IX is straight up about like a child dealing with death is the right. premise. Like having, or 10, religion. And, and what goes on with that and watching someone deal with a truly false religion that has been created. And, mm -hmm. and the way that they keep making these games and dealing with that is something they, they excelled at. But by today's standards, that is, we've tread that path numerous times in numerous games. We've yeah. all done that before. So asking questions, creating something new needs to be something that is something we think about today. And I think with the increase in talking, again, about quantum mechanics and talking about alternate realities and looking at like a bubble universe or looking at different mm. things as science and ideas and views on religion and views on uh, philosophy and faith and all that stuff grow and expand, they are keeping up with that and creating something new for modern sensibilities to think about. And it's not going to be, boy, we probably shouldn't kill the earth. Everyone knows that whether you have decided to accept it or not mm. is a different story, but everyone knows like we live here. So like, it'd probably be cool if we didn't blow it up or whatever. And right. so that telling that story again, is kind of like, we're just beating a dead horse. Why are we doing this? So creating a thing where it's like, okay, we're going to talk about some stuff that we are grappling with right now. We are trying to look at particle physics and reality. And we're trying to see like, how can something exist here, but then exist on the opposite side of the galaxy. And is time real is, Am I existing at the exact same time that Julius Caesar is existing? Are we mm. all just layered on top of it? It's all there, and it's all something that people are genuinely thinking about that they have no answers for, and they're delving into that because it is mysterious, and it is weird, and it is a great mystery. They can add to this story to give us something completely different and new and really mess with us and make us think and make us question things and make us have conversations like this where if you're sitting at home, you're probably like, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> That is, if that you're is sitting what they're doing. here, you might be saying. <laughs> yeah, but they're doing it on purpose. This is clearly designed to make us have right. these conversations and make us talk about it and extend our hype for what is to come. It's a great right. framework for conversation. You're so right. Yeah, absolutely. Jesse, I can't thank you enough for being here. This has been one of the most kind of just mind-bending, just uh, amazing conversations that I've had. Not just about Final Fantasy, but just like sharing the the joys and the frustrations of content creation. You have given us a real gift today, and I cannot thank, thank you, you enough. Thank so you. Thank, thank you for you. being here.
pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you. Thank you for letting uh, me talk. I love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> we love to listen to you. Hey, how can people find you? Tell us a little bit about what you've got coming up. Yeah. Sure. Uh, good news is I have sort of put everything together on jessicox.com. It's just links. That's all it is. Links to the YouTube and the Twitch and the podcast and everything I have is right there. So just J-E-S-S-E-C-O-X dot C-O-M. Everything's there. You can find all my stuff. Um, I'm constantly doing things like uh, I have way too many podcasts, for example. One is called Chiluminati, where we talk about this kind of stuff. Yep. And um, we get real weird with it. Uh, it's three of us talking about everything from paranormal stuff to UFOs to what reality is to all that stuff. And I have to sit there and be like, I don't think that's real. And they're like, oh, it's real, dude. <laughs> and so I'm like, all right. And um, I also do uh, Cox and Crendor with uh, my wonderful co-host, and we just Imagine if Seinfeld was a podcast and there's no point to it. That's the podcast. Love um, it. And then I do all sorts of other things. We do Geek Enders on Fridays, which is just talking nerdy stuff. Uh, I do all that. And then I also make videos and also stream. And I do way too much, as you said in the beginning. And now that I say it, I'm realizing it might be too much. So I will stop there and just say jessicox.com. Well, um, with, with somebody as busy as you are and, and stuff, we, we cannot thank you enough. Everybody, go check out Jesse Cox. Check out all of his stuff. Um, and also, um, just thank you again for being a part of this Final Fantasy VII Rebirth lecture series. Um, every week, we will have more interviews from other content creators. And on Tuesday and Thursday nights, uh, starting at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, we have our lecture plays as we make our way through Rebirth in its entirety. Uh, Evan, any final thoughts before we close out? <clears throat> What a wonderful time. What a wonderful time. I'm, That's I'm, it. I'm grateful for both of you. This was a blast. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. For, for listening and engaging in the conversation. Hopefully, it's a great framework uh, for you to just to get away and talk about some things in your life. And uh, we're grateful to the devs and the writers for all the work that they yeah, put in as well. So just a lot of gratitude all around. Bye-bye, everybody. We'll see you next episode. <laughs> see you in class. See ya. Bye. Massive thanks to Jesse Cox for the interview. Thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with us and sharing all of your thoughts and theories. Big thanks to Husky by the Geek for the use of our theme music. It was awesome. Thanks so much for making that for us. Thanks to Nick Smith, who does our graphics as always. And most of all, and most importantly, this program is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks to you. Great job. Pat yourself on the back. Hope you're having a good week. Hope this finds you doing well and hang in there and we'll see you next episode. Bye-bye.